This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Rick Hogg. H-O-G-G. Rick spent 29 years in the United States Army, most of that time in special operations, deployed 13 times, primarily to Iraq and Afghanistan at the tip of the spear. Right now, he runs Warhog Tactical, and you can check them out at Warhog, that's W-A-R-H-O-G-G.com. Check out that website, ton of knowledge on there, and then you can link to his social channels from there as well. So now... Without further ado, Rick Hogg. When the military bug bites you, was that always something you wanted to do? It, yeah, that was always something, you know, that was there. Um, like I said, my my grandfather, father, you know, military veteran. So there was always that kind of serve there. But then uh, I'm going to tell you what set the hook was probably between uh, John Wayne and the Green Berets. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Rambo, I saw in the movie theaters, but I was older then. So it really wasn't. It, my mind was already kind of set. Hey, I wanted to go that special forces route. Um, well, how old were you when it, you saw when you saw First Blood Part Two? When did it come out? Eighty six, I want to say. No, no, sorry, eighty five. Yeah, so sorry, eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah. So, yeah. so I was like fifteen. I remember seeing it in the movie theater. Okay. You know, so I was fifteen at the time, but just you know, very much like you, sitting there reading books, doing your research. Um, of course, on James Reese's bench, see a lot of Mac B. Sog books. There you, mm-hmm. go. You, you know, but yeah, I mean, you. You try to get as much info as you could, yeah. uh, and that was always the route to go. And what happened with me is when I tried to do the late entry program in 87, the SF Baby program, right. or excuse me, when I talked to me in 86, uh, the SF Baby program was there in 87. They swapped over to a branch that was no longer, so you couldn't do the SF Baby program like we know today. Hey, man, 11 Bravo, you know, so, un- or basically uh, 11 X-ray unassigned infantry. Nice. Uh, you want to go to Air... Airborne, no bonus. Hey, man, you get to jump out of a plane. Sure, I'll take it. And, uh, you know, kind of burn that senior year knowing that you're going to go in the Army. Okay. Um, so literally, I think it was like 10 days after high school, uh, June 88, report down to Fort Benning, Georgia, one station unit training. Uh, get my infantry training done, get jump school done. And then from there, I go up to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, nice. 82nd Airborne Division. And here's the thing, Jack, I never leave Fort Bragg after that. Wow. Well, that's so 29, 29 the epicenter years of the special operations world is, uh, well, is Fort Bragg. It, yeah. Man, that is awesome. So, what was it like in the, uh, in airborne unit? Cause I remember going to Fort Bragg for, uh, the first week of halo school. We went out there to use the tunnel mm-hmm. back in yep. 2000. So use the yep. tunnel and man, I saw everybody running around on, on in formation marching. I mean, huge formations. I remember that stands out to me and I was like, Oh man, these guys are getting yep. after it early in the morning and they are just marching at the same, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. it's a run, but it's a shuffle, but it's not, it's a march and they're all on the road and they're moving these guys all around this base early in the morning. It was wild. But you got to think, Jack, we had, even back in the 80s, we had an enemy back then. So it was the Soviet Union. So the Cold War was much in effect. So you never knew, hey, when was going to be the day potentially mm-hmm. that you were going to go have some type of conflict with the Soviets. So granted, they, you know, you had your little skirmishes throughout the 80s. You had Grenada, uh, Panama, which unfortunately, uh, my battalion participated in the rehearsal, but never actually executed. Oh, man. So that's kind of... Uh, Man, that's a kick. Yeah, when that all happens, you know. So I, I forget our uh, our battalion goes on block leave for Christmas time. I hung out there for a couple extra days. I don't remember what the whole reason was. And then, of course, rumor mill down the road. Hey, man, we're going to Panama. It's like let me try to get on. And that was a debacle in itself because you had officers sitting there booting machine gun AGs off. You know, you had the uh, as rumor has it, I'm not going to say because I wasn't on the aircraft, but supposedly the division commander freezing in the door. Telling the jump master he'll go when he's good and ready because he didn't like quite what he saw on the ground. Whoa. Um, oh, yeah. You know, so it, it was just, they executed it, but was it executed properly? Mm, you know, I think uh, I think General Johnson, if I remember his name right, was going to relive General Gavin's grandeur in World War II, and that just didn't quite mm-hmm. pan out according to uh, the jump team that was on the aircraft. So, again, rumor secondhand. I can't, yeah. I don't have firsthand knowledge, so. You know, rumor is what it is. Yeah, I might, um, I might work that into a book. That sounds uh, 
Yeah, that, that sounds about about right. Uh, yeah. Oh man! So all those officers, they just wanted to get that 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 combat jumper or, or whatever it was, yeah. and so they're booting. Oh, interesting. So so they're booting. Yeah, they're booting guys off. So now you're getting guys hitting on the drop zone, and they don't know because again, how the chalk saw are shuffled and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You go to your assembly area. Hey man, where's my AG? Oh yeah, he's back at Bragg. <laughs> you know, so it's like you're cutting your combat power mm -hmm. because somebody's looking for an award, and it's like, wow. come on. Jeez. So yeah, that was, um, but then of course all those boys, they come back and then they're all bragging. And it's like, really? Come on. And fast forward to 1990, Desert Storm kicks off and Lottie Dottie, everybody pick it up. Let's go. Um, you know, I remember being out in the field and it was pretty much roll in. We had to do some refit because the old classic, Hey, anywhere in the world in 18 hours or less didn't quite fit mm -hmm. because we needed DCUs and some other things. And they weren't prepared to blow out at that big of a scale. Yeah. Um, a couple sets of DCUs. I think we had a few marginal, uh, desert items and then it's like gone. So I remember flying on top of a, uh, a C5 to go over to Saudi Arabia. We had our little Sheridan tanks underneath and we're going to go draw the line in the sand and, and deal with that. So, um, definitely, you know, when you look back, G watt compared to desert storm, apples and oranges, man, there were the infrastructure that the guys had in the G watt. Man, that wasn't there then. Yeah. You know, you're out there, out there trying to make concrete weights and do the best you can with what you got. You know, right. uh, no AFES pogs. You know, <laughs> if there even was, if there even was an AFES, you know, it was yeah, just, yeah. It, it was rough living. But you know, for a young man, it was a good experience. Uh, kind of see all that yeah. piece in action. And you roll so, into yeah. Kuwait with those uh, those tanks and everything. And did, did you have them painted already, or did they get painted uh, beige when they got over there? It, it, listen, so our tanks. Anything that you see beige, yeah. they're well post, you know, they're probably uh, towards the latter part. Okay. All our stuff went over there. Um, and again, our tanks were the little Sheridans because they were jumpable. Okay. Everything we had was still in that woodland pattern. Ready for the full you saw it, Ready for oh Germany. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But if you saw anything from the 82nd that was any type of tan color, uh, we'd try to take mud or other things mm. and just do some hokey camouflage. But all the, the stuff you see that's painted, they were already pre-prepped. So like those M1s. Um, but the 82nd did not go into Kuwait. We were the sweeping Western element okay. uh, along, along with the French. So kind of, you know, closing in. Um, our objective was uh, Talil Airfield. So we ended up securing that. Um, hung out. That's pretty much after we got that, we hung out there and we were just waiting. Hey, man, we're going to roll to Baghdad. And it's like, nope, hold up here. And. Try to destroy as much equipment as you can while you're there and uh, make a note what you got. So we pretty much went Winchester on everything we had demo-wise, grenade-wise, just trying to blow stuff up. We even, <sighs> I, think we, I think we even burned a, uh, a camo trailer with like a uh, book of matches from the MREs just setting a, a mattress that was in there on fire going, one each Soviet camo trailer, gone. Wow. So, yeah. Dang. So yeah. you just had to, uh, we're going to wait another 12 years or so before, uh, before we go in Baghdad. Uh, yeah, give it a little time. Um, well, but here, here, here's the thing, Jack, right? Here's, this will circle back to the 25 year anniversary of Desert Storm. Uh, I told myself when I left out of there in 91, glad I never cut, have to come back here. Yeah. Joke was, joke was on this guy in that one. Yeah. So you probably weren't the yeah. only, only one back then. Oh man. Yeah. So wild. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, how long were you over there in total? Um, I got over there in August, like the first part of August of 90 yeah. and, um, we left April 1st, uh, 91. Okay. So yeah. Yep. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't one of these things where you're going on deployments, you're going there to get the, get the job done and come home type of a type of a thing. Everybody kind of went it, over there and just stayed until it was time to come back. Well, that was the thing we had to wait. So you think you had that build up. So you had basically desert shield. So yeah. that was your buildup phase. I think January 15th, if my memory serves me right, kicks off Desert Storm. But again, that was, you know, a 30-day air war just pounding these guys, man. Yeah. And to watch, as a young man, to watch um, U.S. firepower, especially B-52s, and especially thinking back to Vietnam and the old arc lights and all that other yeah. stuff. I remember, I, I don't know how far or how far a B-52 can travel in like 15, 20 minutes. But man, when he dropped his payload, you could feel it all the way back where we were. And you're sitting there going, man, I hate to be who's yeah. on the other side. And those guys were just, they were beat up from bombs. So, yeah. What's yeah. crazy is, as you know, from later on, when you see 
you know, you're watching something on ISR and you see these, whatever bomb gets dropped and you're like, mm -hmm. oh man, look at that thing. No one's going to survive yeah. that. And then like these, you see these little people just scatter out. You're rats, like, oh. rats scatter. It's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, how does it's this amazing. happen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. incredible. Uh, so then when you get back from uh, that, what's your, what's your plan? Are you uh army stay? You're like, I'm staying in, I'm going to go, you know, what, what is your plan at that I, point? Yeah. I think my plan was always to stay in. Um, so again, it's try to capitalize on opportunities. Yeah. So you got to think that the army was pretty much shut down at that time. Uh, they asked if anyone wants to go to ranger school without going to pre-ranger. And I'm like, yeah, man, sign this guy up. Nice. No suffering before the suffering. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I mean, pre-rangers is really to gut check people to make sure, hey, they're not going to quit when they're down there. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not going to quit. You know, it's like, hey, we're going to see this thing through. Yeah. Um, get done ranger school. So for those ranger qualified individuals out there, 1091 was the last hard class because <laughs> uh, we, were, we were the last one to do Dugway. So in essence, we shut Dugway down. Oh, I didn't know. So there was a, so was a Utah yeah. phase, like a. a yeah. That, so there was a desert phase. Okay. Yeah. So then the desert phase, they, they went from. So was a, um, there were four phases then? There was. Okay. Yes, sir. Nice. Yeah. So desert went from Dugway over to Bliss. Uh, it was there for a little bit. And then they shut the desert piece down altogether. Interesting. So, and why did they yeah. do that? I have no idea. Huh. I, I don't know what the reasoning was. Maybe they thought, hey, we got all these guys that have been over there. I, to me, it made no sense. Yeah. You know, but it's all good. Interesting. Gosh, I remember yeah. about that time. Was uh, uh, Florida? Is that, did a couple of guys not make it around that time frame in Florida? Wasn't there something that happened down there? <sighs> that, that was. So I believe that was mid '90s, if my yeah. memory serves me right. Uh -huh. So I was already over. In, I was in group. Um, by then, uh, we had a guy come up that was RI down there during that time. He wasn't on that walk, but he was down there when those guys got hypothermia, yeah. and that kind of changed, you know, range school and their their safety protocols and procedures for water temperature and, yeah. and all that other stuff. So, oh man, yeah. that's rough. Uh, so you do ranger school and then where do you, where do you, where do you go from there? And what, what, what was ranger school like for you? Was it just like, Hey, just going to do it head down. No, what? It, it's a suck fest, yeah. right? I, I don't, if anyone says it was easy, you're a liar, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you're getting fed again, summer class, you're only getting a meal a day. One now, granted, sometimes, yeah, you get one MRE when you're out in the field, but you might get, uh, maybe like a breakfast and, and dinner meal when you're back in the rear, if I recollect correctly. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's just sleep deprivation, um, child deprivation. How well can you, you know, work? And really it's, it's a leadership school when you yeah. look at it because they're grading you in your position as a leadership. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just, it's, you got to just suck it up and drive on. So you can't just put your head down because God knows where you'll wind up off droning. You got to pay <laughs> some attention. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great course. And, you know, if you really want to take a hard look at yourself, where are you at? It, it's a complete gut check. Oh, so man. I really wanted to go to ranger school. I got, uh, I put in a request for it when I was at my first SEAL team at SEAL team five. And back then, mm -hmm. so late, I get there in 97. Um, so back then they used ranger school as like uh, punishment. Uh, someone needs a little <laughs> bit, <laughs> you need a little more extra attention. All right. Guess where you're going? It, ranger school. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so they'd send guys there. That, that's how they looked at it. Or at least my team, I should just say my, mm -hmm. my little slice of whatever. Um, so that, so I didn't get to go. And so, so I was, it was such a bummer. Uh, then later they realized just how after September 11th, um, how important it was from the relationship building standpoint, when we're all now joint and you're, you know, in a tactical operations center, if you're an officer or whatever, and, and now you're, Oh, Hey, I mean, we were in ranger school together or you both went to ranger school and now you share a common experience. Uh, and so sure. it just, so it was a really beneficial in, in that respect as things got very joint after, um, after nine 11, I still never got to go, but, uh, but I requested it a bunch of times, the same with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was it Sephardic? Is that right? Is that the, uh, uh, yep. yeah. So I requested so that, that too. Never got to go there, but I, I really want to go to some army schools, man. But Sephardic's an interesting beast. Yeah. Um, because when you look at Sephardic, Sephardic had their own dramas because they couldn't, they didn't have enough time to fill the force mm. with um, qualified guys. Yeah. So if you think about um, probably when, when were you looking to go? Uh, I forget. I mean, it's in a blend in my mind, but somewhere when I found out about it, I probably found out about it during my first two, couple of years in looking at a school's list or something like that okay. and saying, what is this? So probably like 98, 99, something like that. Okay, so 98, 99, uh, 
kind of critical years in there. So basically uh, the schoolhouse said, hey, we can't handle doing Sephardic, which was the eight week uh, prep for guys to go to the Sinks and Extremist Force and the four week, they call it Special Operations Training Course, which is basically a four week uh, marksmanship CQB course. Yeah. They ended up passing the four week course back down to the groups. They're like, hey man, you guys train people, train your own. Great concept. And because again, they, they could not get enough bodies through Sephardic to get the SIFs filled. Um, and that, that was a great opportunity for me because at least at seventh group, seventh group took the special force advanced urban combat course near and dear to heart. Uh, group commander had full support. And in essence, um, from what was it? 90, 98 to 2000. We'll, we'll just call it 2001. It's still going on today, but we were basically training guys for war. We didn't realize and what kind of set the hook for me and, and Warhog Tactical and having a tactical training company wasn't I got out after 29 years and going- 29 hey man, years gonna... you did? Dang. 29. 29, yeah, buddy. man. Yeah. That's wild. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, yeah. No, no, <laughs> it, 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 it's good. Uh, I mean, it, it, here's the thing, Jack, right? I enjoyed what I was doing. Yeah. I was super blessed, super fortunate. But, but I have to caveat because a lot of people go, well, you're just in this space because that's what you know. No, this is what I love and this is my passion. So- what set the hook for me is you have to think, I was teaching theory prior to 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, seventh group was like the second wave of guys to go. And I believe it was because number one, we had already advanced to Safavik level two. So we're doing company level operations as uh, SF companies. And then they figured out when fifth group went over, I believe, again, language didn't matter because you had to use Terps anyway. Mm. So kind of knowing this capability, seventh group goes over there. Guys come back, said, hey, man, that stuff you taught me saved my life. That set the hook for Warhog Tactical in Action. So now I'm sitting here, we'll just say 2001, 2002, back of my mind, whenever I retire, this is what I'm going to do. Nice. And I think, it's, I think it's important for veterans out there because like with you, you've always had a passion for writing and reading. I think guys need to find their passion while they're in so that when they transition, I mean, I talked to so many guys, they're in that window of getting out. What are you going to do? I have no idea. What's your passion? What's your love? What's your drive? What yeah. gets you up in the morning? Right. And and if guys can figure that out, man, you're gonna crush life. Yeah. But if but if you're just kicking the can and, and God God forbid that your identity's tied, you know, mm -hmm. to your job, to your title, man, that's even worse. Yeah. So I was very blessed and fortunate, you know, one, to have just a good base of teaching from there. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously end up going back operational 2004. And now you go 2004, last rotation was in 16, and you start Dang. building that combat experience. Yeah, because 16, oh yeah, <laughs> I was there I was there for the 25th anniversary of Desert Storm. Wow. And, and I remember watching on TV, um, uh, what was it, um, AFN, and guys are, oh, look at this. I was like, hey, jerkies, you might see my picture there, you know? I was like, oh, you were, you <laughs> were like, there? Was like, the History oh, yeah. Channel? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Like, but, what's up, old timer? Yeah. Yeah, man. That so, is wild that you got to see it yeah. on TV over there. Oh, man. yeah. 20, 25 years later. Amazing. And I told myself when I left that last time, I said, I am not going to curse myself. I'm not going to say this is the last time. I'm just going to yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. get, get, on, get on the plane and go, all right, here we go. Yeah, that's all you can do. So, oh, man. That's it. Uh, so seventh group, um, I want to go back and ask you about what happened after yeah. Ranger School. But uh, seventh group, I got to go into, into Haiti with uh, Charlie Third of the Seventh. Um, mm -hmm. back in 2004, like February, March, April, whatever that one that was. Um, and yeah. that was an amazing experience. I was just a SEAL liaison down there. So it was mm -hmm. just me and, uh, and the SIF going in. And really what we were going in to do was, uh, no one really knew what was happening outside of Port-au-Prince. So we just kind of flew around. We were ready to rock, but we didn't know what was going mm -hmm. on if like in these villages outside of the city. So we just bounced into these different, different like villages to see what was going on, gather some Intel, that sort of a thing. I'm sure some other guys were doing, you know, some Intel, other stuff, but, uh, uh, it was interesting. I mean, it was really interesting to do. Of course, there were some other guys that were doing some stuff with, uh, Aristide to grab him and, and get mm -hmm. him out of there. Um, so that was yeah. our other, our other group, but, uh, but it was cool to see, uh, army come together, particularly the special operations side of the house, air seventh group and like take over a hangar where we've staged and see these rock drills in real time, mm -hmm. come together. I mean, it was amazing for me as a, Oh, one, you know, brand, brand new officer, uh, to see all that. And then just to, mm -hmm. you know, be a liaison, essentially running some comms and, you know, not, not doing much, but learning. I got to learn yeah. a lot. So that was amazing to, to go in there with you guys. That was really, 
really cool. But, uh, but what'd you do after, after ranger school? Uh, so ranger school, we take a slight break to put some body weight on and get ourselves yeah. uh, fit because here's the thing guys come out of there. Come out skinny. Of, oh God. <laughs> I, I think if my recollect, if my memory serves me right, I think I rolled out of there like 130, 140 pounds. Yeah. I mean, I'd lost like 30 pounds there. So I had super big tree trunk legs. My upper torso looked like nothing. Yeah. But what's funny is, you know, you go down there, they cut you away on leave. You come back a couple weeks later and you're like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man because yeah. you're eating everything you can and your body's just oh, wow. all bloated up. <laughs> um, but no, being being a, a Spec 4 or E4 in the, in the 82nd tabbed, uh, yeah, man, you're part of that powerful Spec 4 Mafia and it's like... No one's gonna mess with you. Nice. You know, so you're not you're not at that leadership level per se. Yeah. Uh, but you got your tab going on. And it's like, yeah, man. So um kind of got all my feelings back in my limbs because somehow yeah. I, I remember, you know, from carrying that ruck and stuff, you know, fingertips all numb and craziness, get your feet back. And then um, what was it? Get my years right. I think it's uh did that in 91. So 92. Um, I go to SFAS, so special forces assessment and selection. Uh, get that knocked out. But the thing was, I had a year wait from SFAS to go to the Q course. Yeah. Um, 82nd doesn't like quote unquote ship jumpers. Got it. Uh, yeah. Even, even I, though you're trying to, I was going to guess even that. Though you're trying to, yeah. Even though you're trying to advance yourself. So I could look at the company OML list and you see all these black lines. Yep. What's OML? My name. So the order of merit list. Uh, so like for schools, right? So, okay. okay. Hey, I want to go, let's say to jump master school. This is a prime one. Uh, yep. You're whatever in either the company battalion, however they had their order of merit list, black line. Right. And I'm sitting, and I'm sitting there going, Hey man, I'm the only guy in this battalion. Cause you had to have this, uh, this jump master pre-car. So you had to go down to the advanced airborne school beforehand, do a nomenclature test and a rigging test. And they would give you a car that was good for like 30 days. I'm like, Hey man, I'm one of the only, I think I am the only guy in battalion that has this card. Why can't I go to jump master? You're leaving. I said, I'm not yeah. leaving the army. Right. I said, yes, I'm, le I'm leaving the 82nd, but I'm not leaving the army. And that was kind of the mentality of, oh, yeah. hey, dude, you're, you're leaving us. You're a ship jumper. Uh, be gone with you. So it's like, okay. Yeah. Um, you're not going to help their numbers of qualified no, jump masters. No. And yeah. It, yeah. So you just kind of bide your time, unfortunately. Right. You know, to me, it was like, all right, cool. I'll just work, work out. out. You know, I still, yeah. I still did my duties within the platoon and stuff, but it, at the end of the day, um, I was not, it, everything was blacklisted. It's like, yeah. oh, you're going to do, you know, hey. do this or that. It's like, all right, <laughs> yeah, fine. That's how it goes. So, oh man. Yeah. Crazy. But then you get to go and, uh, and make it through. Uh, and, yep. and what is your, what is your, uh, specialty here when you go through? Uh, so I'm an 18 Bravo, which is a weapon sergeant. Got it. So, so I try to set myself up for success. So I've yeah. always tried to, for the young, you know, uh, military guys out there, set yourself up for success as much as you can. So what I did was first and foremost, I took a, a Spanish DLPT. So I had a Spanish rating. Okay. Cause again, I'm, I'm trying to get to seventh group. Yeah. Um, and why did you want to go to seventh? Back, just for their area of operation. Okay. So they pretty much central and South America is where they operate at. Um, that's kind of where I wanted to go. Yep. Cause you got to think, I mean, it's all look back at cold war. History. Yeah. You're growing up with the, and you're growing up with the, the Vietnam it, movies and everything like that. Me too. Yeah. Me too. I wanted to get down it, to central South America. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you kind of had all that stuff going on. So, um, took Spanish DLPT, got that done. Okay, cool. Um, back then we used to have to test for Morse code or for the, uh, 18 echo, which was the communications guy. Yeah. I don't care if I knew the right answer for the dots and dits and yeah. wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah. I'm going to blow this thing yeah. because I don't, you know, yeah, I, I can't remember, <laughs> it, you know, uh, I can't remember if we did anything, I don't think we did anything engineer wise, but mm. somehow uh, I got 18 Bravo nice. and that's, that's where I wanted uh, get done the Q course to boot. I get seven special forces group. I was like, spot on. Nice. Uh, so I'm thinking, cool. I'm going right from the Q course to group, you know, bypass language school. Uh, au contraire, because they had the Portuguese language program was just starting up, which winds up being a pro. Mm. So because I wind up uh, having you know, Portuguese language. So I wound up going to a Portuguese team as well, oh, wow. which pays off, which pays off down the road because everyone else uh, within seventh group will never go to Brazil unless they're on a Portuguese team. Nice. They said, Hey man, we got a trip down to Brazil. You guys are going. I'm like, spot on. 
And those were some, uh, some pretty cool guys to work with. Nice. You know, you want to talk about unconventional warfare. Those guys are definitely on it. Um, okay. you know, they're special forces. Yeah. They're special forces guys are based out of Rio, which Rio is just a Mangasso city. Um, I think it was like from where they were based at, this is just kind of size wise yeah. from their base to get over to like, uh, Impanema and Copacabana, which is like the big beaches. Everyone knows it's an hour plus drive with one of their drivers. So it's not like us trying to navigate the roads. They know exactly. This is all prior GPS. These wow. guys know the back roads. Yeah. So yeah, it's just a big layout. Um, but yeah, we did an exercise with them and it was, all right, cool. We're going to go jump in somewhere. So you're in your uniform, you land, get out of your uniform into your civvies. Hey, you need to go recce this location. Don't care how you get there. Uh, me and my Brazilian counterpart, I think we ended up hitching a ride with some dump truck driver. Uh, of course, you got to feed the machine. We stop at some local restaurant to eat real quick, get our eyes on, collect our intel, zip back to our, our rally point and, and prep to do an assault out there. So it was just, it was cool to watch these guys do things like that because you really didn't see that uh, a whole bunch out yeah. of the U.S. military during that time. So it was like, all right, cool. Take that as a, a good teaching point, and, you know, good bunch of guys to work with. So nice. Nice. So they, they were one yeah. of those forces that um, are one of those units that does stuff, uh, you know, in country and out if they have to, or is it like, like that, is that, that sort of a thing? Like are they a national police I, force also type of a deal? I, I never, I never got the straight answer, straight answer there. Or maybe I just don't recollect yeah. or maybe got lost in communication because I don't know if it was even really addressed at the time. Yeah. Um, Cause I know you had the police at the time going up to, into the uh, favelas, you know, killing the, uh, the homeless kids and all that issues and drama. So it's Rio's a very interesting city because it's yeah. like you go to the beach and very nice, very clean, very pristine. But as you start going back, there's almost layers Yeah. until you kind of get up into the hills where the favelas are at. And it's just like houses on top of houses and just let me steal this power from this one and just wires and just crap running everywhere. Wow. Yeah. So it was uh, interesting to see that point, but yeah. I, you know, I don't recollect if those guys did anything there or if that was like their national police or okay. heck, maybe they just took one uniform off and stuck on another one and did their yeah. business. I, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. Wild West stuff, man. That's awesome. I've yeah. never been to Brazil. I always wanted to go, go down there. Um, yeah. I yeah. highly recommend it. Need to go down and do some research for a future novel down there. I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's on my list. Um, yeah. so you're, you're at seventh group when, uh, September 11th happens. I was. Yeah. So I was working at the uh, Advanced Urban Combat Committee. Uh, come back from Chow, walk into the team room and it's like, what is going on? So we had a you know little TV there. Fox News is on. And it's like, all right, seems a little odd. Mm. Um, I don't know how a plane flies into the, uh, the World Trade Center, but I'm like, dude, you got to be off on that one. But then when you start seeing the second one, all right, something's up. Uh, then obviously the Pentagon, you know, you hear about... Um, uh, the one in Pennsylvania. So all of a sudden we start going, Hey man, we got to get some security going on around here. Cause Fort Bragg was an open post. You could come and go as you want. Mm. At the time we were the only guys that really had access to, to guns and ammo. Cause you got to think during that time, you've got to draw ammo from the ASP. Nobody really had it there. Um, so we basically had our own arms room, had our own field ASP. Mm. And next, you know, we're the guys grabbing bullets, getting guns, trying to go, how do we secure at least our group area? Yeah. It, 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 nothing else. How do we lock this down? Uh, and then of course you get the phone call from you suck because they find out they're right across the street. Oh man, you guys got guns and bullets. You, you need to send some people over here. It's like, <laughs> throttle back guys. I said, we got to take care of our own house first. Um, so basically September 11th, I wind up kind of, if you want to say the seventh group QRF for that evening, mm -hmm. Uh, end up departing to go home September 12th. And as I'm leaving Fort Bragg, the traffic getting back, because all of a sudden we decide we're going to implement, right. um, you know, control points. There's cars jacked back for miles, I man. I mean, just backlog checking everyone's ID cards. Yeah. And I'm like thinking to myself, glad I'm not in that line. So I guess I'll keep the night shift. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that went on for a little bit. So they got their permanent uh, right. entry control points, which they have now. Right. Uh, that's all, you know, so people don't realize Fort Bragg used to be a wide open post. Yeah, we were um, too. And SEAL teams, you could just yeah. drive right on. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, yep. I remember thinking about yep. it back then. I'm like, all right, I guess this is well, how we do it. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, well, it, the same thing, because I went up to Little Creek uh, in the 90s 
which I learned a valuable lesson with the Navy, is you never tell the Navy your true rank, especially as an Army guy, oh, right? We're all E, we're all E sevens or better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because again, on an SFODA, I might have E five, E six, all the way up to eights. You know, then you know either a warrant or an officer. Well, why is it my E sixes and below are over here at the, mm. the swill barracks, right? Interesting. And then you got your sevens and above at the chief's BEQ, uh, living large. Okay. So we had to do some. Oh no no no! Oh, these, yeah. these guys, they're promotable or you know, right, frocked right, right. or whatever. They now you're trying, out. yeah, you're trying to use some uh, some navy term, right? And oh well, I, I guess we need to bring them over. Of course you do. You know, ID cards. We never got new ones. You know, just telling lies. <laughs> but yeah, that was a. That was an important thing to learn. Yeah. And whenever you do anything, anything with the Navy, um, yeah, everybody's an E7. Always an E7. Yeah. <laughs> always an E7 or better. Yeah. Um, they don't like, I had to go down to Stennis, uh, do some work with those guys down nice. there. They, they don't like when you go to the quarter deck and ring the bell. I figured, you oh, know, it's like a ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh-uh. Bang, 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 yeah, bang, yeah. bang, you know, right. ringing on that thing. It's like, hey, where's that microphone? I think yeah. it was seventh groups in the house or wh- whatever they said when the, the, uh, the command would come on deck. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just, it, it was learning those sister service little sure. terms and kind of messing around. So just having some good, good fun. Yeah. With those guys. Dennis is cool. Yeah. You guys got to do a lot of the, the, the riverine stuff. I never got to, to do that, but yeah. Um, what a cool, what a cool mission. I think it's a, a little kind of hidden gem in, of naval special warfare oh, is the, uh, the 100 Dennis. Yeah. 100%. And, and you'd never know, you know, it's like, if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. You'd never know they were there. Right. So yeah. Yeah, that program's Very gotten cool. a lot better over the years as far as uh, training and selection and mm-hmm. all that stuff. Those boat guys, oh, yeah. they know what they're doing. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's pretty legit. We we use the boat guys over in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. Around the, on the rivers. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and you felt, you know, so it was a double-edged sword, right? You've got your armor on. It's not like you got any water rings or something. Hey, if I got to go on the drink, I'm going to just bail this fest and, and deal with it. But you're yeah. sitting there on this boat going, look at how much firepower. Yeah. Is just on. It's just, just mind mind boggling. Uh-huh. You know, so yeah, you feel pretty comfortable. It's like, all right, if you mess with us, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree because this thing will put some heat out like nobody's business. Yeah, and then you talk about having three of them or so, or four of them, and uh, yep, uh, yeah. If you, in what Act of Valor, that SEAL movie that they made years ago, mm-hmm. um, that shows those uh, riverine boats and getting after it with the mini guns. And- oh yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So uh, September 11th happens, and how long is it before you mm-hmm. uh, you get in the fight? Because you're not you're uh, you're you're at that training. Is that more of a training? Yep. Position that you're in right then. Yeah. So I'm still at seventh group. I'm in I'm in a training position. Um. But then, <laughs> special forces has this way to sucker people back to the schoolhouse. So uh, if you remember, you know, you wanted to go to uh, to Sephardic. Yeah. Well, that's all run by the Special Warfare Training Center. Yeah. So of course they're like, hey. Uh, it's your time to come back and quit hiding. They like to e- evening group, right? You're hiding behind the rucksack. No, mm-hmm. I'm doing my job. But they dubbed it hiding behind the rucksack. So we're going to lure you back um, to Swick for a little bit. Wait, they'll hiding behind up. the rucksack? You mean you're staying? You're staying operational? And they call it hiding yeah. behind the rucksack? Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it, even with the 82nd, all right, you're a ship jumper there. Uh, you go to group. You're hiding behind your rucksack because you want to do your job yeah. and not go you teach go in the schoolhouse. Yeah. Yeah. And so long story short, um, wind up, uh, do two years there out at SFAS. So I'm out doing that piece and then 2004, go back operational. Okay. And then, yeah, we stay operational the rest of the duration. So where'd you go first in Iraq? Uh, to Baghdad. Okay. So Baghdad, 2004, yeah. so, we we're there at the same time then. Uh, no, so I actually got over there. So, uh, 2005, like January okay. 05. Um, and you got to think that was right around election time. So everyone's focused on, uh, trying to make sure the elections go off without a hitch. Yeah. So, you know, we're out sitting there going, Hey, if you're a VBID guy, you're the guy we're targeting. Cause that was the biggest issues and dramas of the time over there. Yeah. Um, I don't think if, if my memory serves me right, I don't think a single VBID went off, uh, during election time, if I remember right. Oh, dang. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we'd stayed, trust me, we stayed very busy. Yeah. Um, getting after people. So right. that was a good time to be there. Yeah. Cause it was just, I mean, Oh, I mean, it, I mean, it was bad because we had so many horrible strategic level decisions by the people that we mm-hmm. trust to make 
those decisions up there, but tactical level decisions as you're adapting on the fly, figuring it out mm-hmm. in sustained combat operations now. <laughs> so you can really, you know, yeah. not just have a flashpoint and make, so should we change this or not? No, you're in sustained combat operations and the enemy's changing mm-hmm. at the same time, trying to do it faster than you are. You're getting to adapt and you're getting to figure things out. Yep. And you're essentially, I mean, you're getting all this experience um, that, it, you know, essentially Vietnam was a watershed moment in special operations history, as you know, for SF, mm-hmm. for SEALs. Um, and then now we have it again after September 11th. And during that time in, in Baghdad or in Iraq in general, um, that was a, mm-hmm. that was a time because we, now we have EFPs coming over, uh, starting to come yep. over from, uh, from Iran and you have bomb makers and you're figuring out these networks, the Intel piece, you're getting better at that, uh, getting mm-hmm. better at the human side of the house at the same time that you're getting better at the technical collection side. So you can kind of oh, yeah. uh, corroborate, you know, different stories and really put together these target decks and go after the right people for the right reasons. Um, mm-hmm. unfortunately, you know, strategic level decisions as far as disbanding the Iraqi army and debathification essentially put that country back to the, the stone age. Cause everyone with a job in government was a bathist obviously. Yep. And uh, everyone in the army uh, could now become an insurgent. Um, mm-hmm. and so, I mean, talk about creating the conditions, uh, via strategic level decisions to put guys like you, um, guys like our, our friends there on the front line, some of the most tactically disadvantageous positions they could, but hey, mm-hmm. we learned a lot. That's for sure. Well, it, we learned a lot, but here's the thing. It, we definitely, um, we took control of the night. You nice. know, we owned, we owned the night when it came to combat operations. Here's the thing. If I was out in Iraq during the day, man, that's even playing field, mm-hmm. you know, but when you're out there at night, you got your nods and your lasers and, you know, technology's working for you, man, you know, those guys are, they're at such a disadvantage. And it, it you know, I can remember driving down Red Irish. We're blacked out and you've got your, um, were they the, uh, sweep teams, the ID sweep teams out there with their white lights on. I'm yeah. like, Hey dummies. Oh yeah. It, you know, and then they're trying to spotlight you. It's like, Hey dude, yeah. shut that thing off and just leave us alone. We're blacked out rolling fast. And you're out there telling everyone, Hey man, here I am. Blow me up. It's like, get away from these guys. But the army just never really, at least from what I saw, really embraced the whole idea of this night vision capability mm. really special operations did. Oh yeah. But the army, the army as a whole never mm. got that. And it was just mind boggling. It's like, you would see guys at night from the regular army with their PVS 14, which I don't know who sold them on a monocle type mm. night vision device, but that's here nor there. And that thing's up. I'm like, why are you not using it? You know, or you've got your monocle and you got no laser. I'm, I'm just right. like, it does not compute, man. Yeah, no, exploit so, all technical and tactical advantages. That's what an old uh, yeah. CEO told me after he came back from a, a first, he's been like a year in Afghanistan um, with the with the color squadrons right after September 11th. So he brought some mm-hmm. lessons back and that was one of them, exploit all technical and tactical advantages, which would include our nods and our lasers uh, for oh, yeah. sure. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it, it would be interesting to see see some of the uh, Marines even too, seeing some of the gear that they had, especially at that time, you know, to, you're like, wait a second, oh, September 11th was a couple God. years back. It's 2005 and you're looking at what they're using and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, amazing. It, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but, but the Marine Corps, I mean, they're an interesting breed, right? So we wound up, um, cause 05, we ended up doing a, a push out West, um, to Al Anbar and, and over to uh, Al Assad. And that place is like, the leadership there, these guys were doing zero offensive operations out of Al-Assad. So you sit there and wonder, why was al Anbar like the wild, wild west? Because mm-hmm. these guys weren't allowed to do anything. Mm-hmm. And they had these young Marines so brainwashed. I mean, I remember when we first roll up there. And here we are rolling up to their, their gate or whatever. It's like, do you guys have permission to be here? Need permission. <laughs> Dude, open up the gate, man. We need some gas and some chow. You know, it's, yeah. it's time to get busy. Oh no, we got to go call. I think it was like Scorpion Base or whatever. We got to call and get permission. Mm. Get permission. They had these kids just totally brainwashed. And, you know, but you'd sit there. I remember we did, we went out to some fob that was out by the, the Syrian border. I think there was like maybe a platoon, platoon plus out there. These guys had hard living. Yeah. But they were trying to make the best of what they got. Um, until somebody decided to write some profanity in the uh, in the port of John and the lieutenant shut that stuff off and said, hey, you're now going to crap in a plastic bag. So, 
It's so but brutal. It, and people wonder where I get all the, all the, uh, you know, <clears throat> my incentive to, to, uh, to write in my novels and describe certain officers as politicians and, you know, people like that. You can see it in the show. We got a couple lines into the show. Uh, mm-hmm. Terminal list on Amazon Prime about, uh, you know, sh- hit that five o'clock shadow when you're in garrison from the, uh, from the Admiral yeah. to, to Reese. Yeah. So, you know, we get a couple of those things in there. A couple, a couple of jabs at our, uh, it, yeah, that's just how it, it is, I guess. Well, it is, but it's like, here's the deal. The military, it just, you should not be in a leadership position for politics. Yeah. This is Rick's opinion, right? I am here for my men. Yeah. And like what I would tell my guys, hey guys, check it out. Here's all I ask. Don't lie to me. Because mm-hmm. if you lie to me, oh, yeah. I can't trust you. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Trust up and down the chain. You have to have 100%. it. 100%. Mm-hmm. So if you tell me the truth, and here's the other thing. Bad news does not get better with time. Yep. Something happens, tell me, right? Here's the deal. I'm going to walk with you right, wrong, or indifferent. If we're right, dude, I'm, I'm right there with you. Even if you're wrong, I'll still walk with you. There's nothing I can do, right? But I'm not going to cut you to the wolves. Mm-hmm. You see too many times these guys just sit there and, you know, Joe messed something up. Okay, cool. He's still your guy, right? He did something wrong, whatever the case may be. Don't sit there and, and throw him to the wolves. Oh, yeah. You know? And, and, and everybody stand else up. sees that I mean, too. The rest of the guys see that. And then what do you do? You've like, you've totally eroded that trust that whatever you built up it, to that point with those guys, because mm-hmm. they're not, it's not just about that one person and you can totally change exact same situation. And you go to bat for that person. That's a good operator that, you know, messed up, whatever. Um, yeah. and, uh, now the other guys see that too. And now you built that even a stronger trust, uh, with all those 100%. guys uh, and they see it yeah. and it's, and, and that translates to, to downrange. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. trust. That's when I, when I finally got back from Iraq and my last time and I thought about it, cause I, I've just been doing for so long and I took a breath and I was like, oh, okay. Why, you know, why, whatever, why was I successful? Whatever. Um, trust, trust up and down the chain mm-hmm. of command, trust with the guys, not letting any opportunity, every opportunity, every interaction is an opportunity to mm-hmm. build trust, whether I'm passing you in the hallway and in the morning and we're going to yep. stop for 30 seconds or two minutes, uh, or if I have an opportunity to get out to the range and I can get out there and I can make it even as I work my way up the chain and maybe there's a meeting mm-hmm. that I need to go to or whatever else, but I can get out to that range and we can run, we can, you know, run some stress courses. Mm-hmm. And, uh, even as you work your way up the chain, maybe I'm not the fastest anymore, but I'm still up there near the top. And all the mm-hmm. younger guys can be like, wow, look at this guy. He's still out here with us. He's still running the O course. He's still looking at hit that plate rack. Look at him and beat so-and-so on that plate rack. No way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you gotta, gotta get out there and you gotta use every mm-hmm. single opportunity, every single interaction, uh, to build trust. Uh, and you know, the big ones like you're describing, but even the small yeah. ones, even the small ones, even the small ones. But to me, Jack, it was the, when the rumor mill would trickle down, whoever at that leadership position was basically blocking trash from coming down to you that you had no idea, mm-hmm. right? They're out there battling for you unbeknownst behind doors, behind closed doors, whatever you want to say. And then it trickles down. Hey, man, did you hear what so-and-so did? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. He, he told so-and-so to go pounce in. Mm-hmm. We're not doing X, Y, or Z. And you're like, dude, that now you just take that guy for actions you didn't even visibly see. Exactly. And you go, what do you want me, what do you want me to do? Where are we going? Exactly. I'll follow you anywhere. Right. Let's go do this. So it's just, that's what the, that's the part people don't get. And I don't care whether you're military, law enforcement, leadership, entrepreneur, whatever job you're in, back your people and sit there and have that trust tree. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if that trust gets broke, then it's done, but you always back your people. It's, it's like current day. I tell the law enforcement guys that I train, I tell them, I back the people I train. You're in a difficult world. If you're ever in a pinch, you know, where God forbid, you know, you have to use your firearm uh, to protect yourself, others, whatever the case may be. And it winds up going to trial. I was like, just show me all your footage. I said, just let me see what you got. If it's clean, dude, I will testify for you all day long. And they're like, you'll do that? I'm like, why wouldn't I? You know, it, because these chiefs aren't back. And so I just use that from a from aspect of law enforcement guys. They know they're out there flapping. They know they've got no top cover. Yeah. It, you know, at least have the top cover. If the chiefs of America would just do this. Hey guys, here's the rope. Because in essence, that's what we had. Here's the rope. What are you going to do with it? You're going to hang yourself with it or is it just going to be there? Mm. And just tell them, hey, man, right, wrong, or indifferent, I will walk with you. If you're right, dude, we're not breaking the bond. If you're wrong, I'm still going to walk. I'm not going to throw you the wolves. And you will have people that will sit there and want to follow you and want to do what you say. 
and do a better job for it. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's leadership one-on-one, man. But you start going, hey man, where's that next rank at? Where's this next promotion? What are you getting out of it? You know, cool. You, you're putting some more money in your pocket, mm. but are you take are you taking care of your boys? Yeah, and that that's the question at the end of the day. Yeah, it's really you can see it. You can sense that the E five mafia sure knows uh, what you're there for. <laughs> oh you no, know, you can't. You're, oh, not, yeah. you're not fooling them, uh, mm-hmm. man. So when you're in uh, Baghdad, then do you have a specific mission set? Are you like hitting uh, ID makers, and or what is your your mission set? Um, man. It, I think at that time, if I recollect correctly, and again, they all they all start to blend know, together. Who you're talking, especially about. for you? So you did how many? Did you do thirteen? I did thir- thirteen. Jeez, yeah. that's incredible, yeah. man. Um, I, I remember 05 because 05 was a big. I was there for the majority of the year mm. uh, because our typical rotations were like there three, home for six, and we just had that constant turn and burn. Uh, we wind up in 05 being there the majority of the year. That was just the year to push. Yeah. Um, remember, it started off, you know. Again, elections were coming up and that was the big, you know, we want this thing to go off without any VBIDs going off in Baghdad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, then as we start progressing, who's, who's the next, enli- I don't, I don't all recollect, you know, whatever the target deck said, that's who we went after, prosecuted those targets. And, you know, it just seemed like it was, it was always whack-a-mole. Yeah. Th- there was never no shortage of bad guys out there. Right. So, Man. Yeah. That's wild. And so you just keep doing that. You're just on that rotation uh, through the rest of the time in the in the military it, then. Yeah, up until 10. So I think it was around 10. Um, 10, we transitioned out of Iraq. We go over to Afghanistan um, because that was, I think the sofa wasn't met if I remember right. Yeah. Um, there was some, something happened there where it was like, hey, US forces are departing. Okay, cool. Still got a fight going on over on in uh, Afghanistan. Pick it up over there. Uh, we changed our rotation cycle somewhere in there to uh, to like a four and twelve. Mm. So it's basically now you're going four um, home for twelve. If I recollect correctly, um, I forget what year was it. Fourteen ish. I think we transitioned back to Iraq. Mm. The whole ISIS deal, if I remember right. Yeah. Uh, and for me, my last gig was in sixteen, twenty uh, fifth anniversary. I, I, if I remember nothing else from that trip, I, I remember the 25th anniversary for, you know, Desert Storm going on going, great. <laughs> I never saw this. I never saw this one. So, And what were you guys doing in yeah. 16 over there? Uh, it was still just ISIS stuff going yeah. on. So if I, if I recollect correctly. Yeah. Amazing. And so. then when do you decide, <laughs> I mean, you passed 20 a while back there, 20 mm-hmm. years. Um, when do you decide, okay, coming up, uh, it's time to, time to move on and this is what I'm going to do. Well, here's a funny story. Um, I hit my retention control point. So the army basically told me I had to get out. Uh, I had asked for an operational extension because back in 2010, uh, I became a canine handler. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So that's it. the canine piece is a big part of me. So like, if you kind of look back here, yeah. uh, that's, that's Duco's vest back there. Oh, that's a picture. That's a picture of Duco there. Um, from the Warhog tactical side, we've got the in on our Duco loop leash. So that's our canine product line we just launched. Nice. So yeah. So that the canine piece starting, you know, from 10 till I retired was a big piece of me and what I did. Yeah. And then, of course I got my in on yeah. Duco Blackbeard and Friends series. Um, but yeah, so that that's a big, a big part because here's the thing, Jack, right? I, I really didn't want to do it. I was kind of voluntold. Uh-huh. Hey man. Uh, go take the dog team over, you know, help your leadership, yada, 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 get promoted. I don't want to do that. I want to sit down. I want to go run with the boys still, right? right. I'm, I still run with the same guys, but now I just got the best combat multiplier in the battlefield. Yep. And then since I know everybody, it's like I'm an independent agent. So it's not like anyone's got to babysit me. Hey, do yeah. this. I'm doing this, doing that. Um, nice. Good buddy. Good buddy of mine. It used to crack me up. Come on the radio. Hey, man. Where are you at? And I'm like, right behind you. And he's like, <laughs> dude, I, I know the playbook, right? I, I know how this thing's going to yeah. play out. So just, yeah, let's get set up, go do our business. But, nice. um, well, that's yeah, why did each group piece. have their own, uh, like a uh, canine program or was it centralized or what was your guys' <clears throat> program like? So the, within, um, within USASOC, you got to think, um, so the groups had, they were a little late kind of getting to the game, building the program, you know, same thing with the Rangers. So we kind of had our program going earlier. Um, 
they finally kind of got everything on board, kind of learning what we were doing. Cause we learned, you know, when we first started this thing, it's like, Hey, we need these dirty, nasty junkyard dogs. Or so we thought mistakes on us. You know, we learned that, Hey man, we can have a, a sociable dog. They can still bring it when need be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a lot better than getting guys bit and having all these just mm-hmm. problems we were having. Uh, cause some of these dogs, man, they'd be like, well, I'm biting somebody. Mm. Nobody, nobody here to bite this bad. I'll just bite one of the guys, mm. you know? So that's not good. For, that's not good for business. Um, you know, so we, we kind of morphed over time. And of course, I think you guys with your, you know, your dog program, you know, kind of helped you guys out as well. So there's a bunch of spreading that knowledge. Yeah. And really that was for me, why I wanted to stay that extra year, one to take me to 30, but two, we just had, <clears throat> we were kind of that influx where there was a lot of guys getting out and it's like, Hey, I want to still pass this combat experience kind of onto the next generation. Let's make sure we haven't lost these lessons learned, uh, keep this program going and then go from there. But yeah. unfortunately, uncle, uncle sugar was like, no, <laughs> dude, you hit your mark and pack, pack your bags and go. So, um, but it, it's been, it's been good. Um, great experience from that, you know, obviously retiring Duco able to bring him back home with me. Uh, I lost him uh, July 5th, 2021 to osteosacoma. Um, after losing him, you know, it's one of those that you want to talk about losing part of your soul. So, I mean, literally, I'm alive because of that dog. Now, when you bring him home, you watch that transition into just a great uh, family member. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to call him a pet because he's so much more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> end up losing him. And it's like the bond between the handler and, and canine is just, unless you've been there, it's a very difficult thing to explain. Mm-hmm. You know, they become part of you. Uh, they're an extension of you on the battlefield. So all these things going on. So end up losing him. And, you know, you got to look at out of tragedy. What's, what's coming out of it. What can you change? What can you do? And we started the in honor of Duco project. So I partnered with uh, a 501 C three called Scott's wish. And I, I don't remember how we, got up with those guys, but basically said, Hey, um, I've got this idea for this in honor of Duca project kind of, you know, pass it by them and like, yeah, sounds good. And it's really this, I, I'm, I'm selfish. Um, basically three core mission statements, mission statement. Number one, uh, keep the memory of combat assault dog Duco alive. They say you die twice. Once when you physically uh, have your last breath, once when your name said for the last time. So yeah, we want to keep that name going. That's why like with our canine product line, it's the in honor of Duco loop leash. Got it. Um, the second one, which is kind of near and dear, is to never let another SOF canine handler make a medical decision about their partner based on their finances. Mm-hmm. So when Duco was diagnosed with osteosacoma, that's like, yeah, we can sit there and save his life or extend his life, however you want to look at it. Cost $10,000. You know, there's no dog EVA for these guys, there's no care. Mm. Um, who knows how many guys, I mean, there's at least one guy here. Cause here I am. That's alive because of that dog. Mm-hmm. But USG says you get no benefits when you get out. So when you retire them, here's your leash, have a good, you know, good life. Um, on that note, you know, cause you got to think people forget that up until 2000, we used to euthanize military working dogs. So it, it took Congress to pass a law that, Hey, they will at least have the opportunity to go back to their handlers. If, if they want to, or not be euthanized. Okay. What year was that? Service. 2000. 2000. Yeah. Um, Congress did something gonna, useful. Man. Well, they did something, they, they did something useful. Uh, I'm not going to let the whole cat out of the bag. We're going to try to push them to do some more stuff. Okay. And, and we're doing that with, um, so we're working on K canine documentary. Here's the thing. I want to get handlers from World War II, and this has been the hardest thing trying to capture their history. Yeah. I don't know if we, I don't know if we have any more left Jack. Yeah. You know, I, I've tried to reach out to everybody I know that, Hey, you know, if somebody should hear the podcast, if you know, a world war II handler, if you know somebody that was just around the dogs, I mean, we're at that point. If you have any, t- you know, touch point with canines in world war II, please reach out, uh-huh. go to warhog.com, go to my website, hit the email button, send me a note. Uh, because that history is being lost. Yeah. We have some Korean War guys. Mm. Uh, we have some Vietnam guys, and obviously we've got some some GWA guys. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it's 
telling these stories. Um, <clears throat> how are the dogs used? You know, what happened to them? So if you look at World War II, all the dogs at the European theater, because uh, let me back up. The military had to ask people to donate their dogs. So Dogs for Defense was the program during World War II where people would just, hey man, have my dog to the war effort, right? Wow. Different mentality back then. Um, all the dogs that went to the European theater, none came home. Military said, nope, they're not deemed coming back and got rid of them all. On the Pacific theater, I believe there was a couple hundred that made it back. Um, same thing, you know, you look at, um, <clears throat> so then we fast forward to Korea, Korea and Vietnam. It, by that time, the army was paying people for their animals. Mm. Um, but Korea, I don't know, uh, still not a good history there, but I don't think if yeah. any came back from there. And I know Vietnam, uh, over 4,000 dogs served. And when it was time to pull out in 75, yeah, you guys are sitting there and off you go. So, wow. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's, it, but we want to capture that history, yeah. right? Um, because especially with the World War II guys, that history potentially could be lost. Oh, yeah. Lost, for, lost forever. Yeah. So. I was talking to two World War II veterans yesterday. They called, um, my daughter and I went to Normandy this last year mm -hmm. um, and took uh, 23 uh, World War II veterans with the Best Defense Foundation back there. And that's part of their mission, too. They, they're they taking veterans back to the battlefields on which they fought to, you know, say goodbye, make peace. You know, that it, it's incredible mm -hmm. to be there. Uh, my 16-year-old little daughter, I've never seen her like that like this. I mean, she's just uh, so engaged listening to these stories from mm -hmm. these guys that are all either creeping up on a hundred or over a hundred. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, I'm going to reach out to, to Donnie Edwards at Best Defense Foundation and see if they've talked to uh, anyone who's mentioned uh, dogs in, in World yeah. War II. So I'll, I'll do that and we'll get, I'm going to run off this podcast and I'll get back to yeah. you on it. Um, man, that is just, wow. That's incredible. But yeah. Well, they're collecting those histories because, you know, well, like you said, they're we, we, not going to be around much longer. No, no, we need it. You know, it's like these guys are, are we're losing them. Yeah. And here's the thing. Um, we're talking to one of the, you know, a, uh, a Vietnam veteran. So we have U S service members still missing in action. Um, we left canines over there. He, he kind of proposed the idea, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could go back to where the dogs were buried at and get my dog back home? Well, we've got JPRA, so the Joint Personnel uh, Recovery, which does uh, searches for remains. So we're going to try to leverage them and go, hey, man, they're still U.S. service members. You might count them as equipment. They were still living, breathing creatures that served this country. Let's go repatriate them. Let's bring them back home. So we'll see where that goes. But th this is how much, this is where, um, how much of an impact this whole canine piece had on me, mm -hmm. you know? So throughout my time, saved numerous times by these dogs, just absolutely incredible. So let's go ahead and pay some things forward. Um, Cause you got to think from the SOF side, we didn't have a canine memorial until I believe it was 2000, was it 14 or 15? Uh, we finally got one down here at the uh, airborne special operations museum. So, you know, I think there's one now at the, at the, Navy SEAL Museum. Um, I know up at the Navy SEAL Memorial up in Virginia Beach, they don't have the names, but they got the paw prints next to the okay. gold stars. So we're starting to see yeah. more people embrace um, what's over in Guam. We got the, the World War II dogs, you know, from the Pacific Theater. So we're seeing more and more, but let's, let's get this dog thing to where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, and we're working on some stuff. And I don't want to totally let the cat out yeah. of the bag. We're working on we're working on some stuff. Uh, hopefully, when 2022, I think we're going to have a shift in power up on the hill. Uh, I'm specifically hoping that a couple special operations combat veterans uh, get up there because I would love nothing better than to have a junior representative special operations combat veteran put some legislation in front of their peers that will be a game changer um, for our four legged canine partners. So. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That canine that, program, that, to watch it evolve from my first deployment in Afghanistan all the way through. And in that first one we had, I think it was a, 
maybe it was a Navy master at arms or maybe it was an army MP. Mm-hmm. I forget, but, uh, you know, it was just, that was the dog that we had at the time. Cause yeah. it wasn't really a, a program yet. Mm-hmm. Um, the Israelis, if I remember correctly, had a, had an early program. They've been doing it for a mm-hmm. long time. I think the, I think the, uh, the CAG guys got in a little earlier on it. So anyway, it, it evolved over time and, uh, to what mm-hmm. it is today or what it was anyway, back with my last touch point with it, which is a few years old now, but, uh, amazing. Uh, evolution yeah. of that uh, of that program. Incredible. Well, here's here's the crazier part, Jack. Right. So if you look at our our Canaan program, it's ebbs and flows. Mm. So of course we spiked World War II, Korea, Vietnam, you know, kind of GWAT era. Rumor on the street, you know, is hey, we're looking to potentially cut back on the dog program, right? Oh. And, and you're like, guys, you can't, you just can't pull this thing out. You know, you've got to keep it going. It's no different. Why do you send soldiers to the range? Why do you sit there and go, hey, hone your marksmanship skills so that, hey, when that time comes, you've got the capability. Same thing with the dog. If you're not, if you don't have dogs in your fleet, you're just not going to pull them out and, and right. willy nilly do something. So, um, yeah, what are those soft truths? Course, what are those soft truths they used to have on the walls? <sighs> uh, what, 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 yeah. I, I forget how many there were, but Pe- can't, soft can't be mass produced, I think was one of them. Yeah. So, to, yeah. include, cl- to include the dogs. That's it, man. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, that was a big part of the, of, of that. And then carrying it over, um, you know, still very much doing it today. Um, then, like I said, you know, we've got the In Honor Duca project with Scott's Wish. Um, we've got our big fundraising. So we're prepping for our big fundraising gala uh, in November. So we do it right after Veterans Day. So nice. September 12th, uh, which is cool because it's, down in Covington, Louisiana. So the World War II National Monument oh, down wow. in New Orleans. Yeah. So it's just, it's kind of, we might, again, trying to put things together, yeah. uh, maybe do something the day before there, but definitely do our uh, our big fundraising event. Um, invites to you, if you oh, want to be you. part of the, if, if you want to be part of the host committee, uh, more than love to have you out, or if you just want to kind of lend your name to what we're doing. Um, no, thank you. That's you amazing. Know, that's amazing. I love yeah. it. No, it, there's so many guys like you that are so passionate about these, <laughs> these projects that have touch point, real life touch points with them that are raising awareness. And obviously the things you're doing with Congress. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. That is, uh, that is very well, well at the same time, you're still running the training programs, right? <laughs> yeah. It, Warhawk tactical still up and going, but I'm going to circle back to the, the, in on Duca project real quick. So this year's fundraiser, we're doing things a little bit different. Um, so last year was our first one. It was kind of, about me and Duco, right? More about Duco, but just bringing awareness. Mm-hmm. This year, we're bringing um, handlers and we want to memorialize their dogs as well because we want to, hey, it's just, yes, it's the In Honor of Duco project, uh, but we also got other dogs out there to recognize. Um, so that's a little shift. And I'm sure we'll keep shifting each year and, and changing stuff up. But um, no, Warhawk Tactical, man, we're, we're full blown, wide open, um, you know, if you look at our huge staff of me and my wife <laughs> <laughs> yeah. running the program, right? Um, Mill Ellie business is is out of control right now. Right. Um, I, I haven't had a bunch of time to do open enrollment classes. So I got a bunch of civilians going, hey man, when are you doing this? When are you doing that? Right. Uh, oh, so it's strictly, probably, it's strictly uh, Mill Ellie right now. Right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I had, let me go two weeks ago, um, week long mill course. Again, Guys going into harm's way, wanting to make sure they've got their concealed carry vehicle counter ambush stuff dialed in. It's like, yeah, dude, we'll we'll get you straight. Um, you know, of course, with all the stuff going on with our LE guys, they're being very reactive, you know, to what happened down in Texas and kind of all these these mass shootings. Um, and that's keeping us super busy trying to get that straight. Yeah. You've got the other part is you've got a a big transition in the law enforcement world. So with their handguns looking to go to red dot pistols. Right. Um, I don't know if you remember back in the nineties when we started putting red dots on our rifles and everyone was like, Oh, it's going to be slower. And Oh, it's this. And Oh, there was all these arguments, right? Oh, really? So Where, I, I kind of missed that. Oh, I, I got that in the civilian side of the house because I was training up to go into the seal teams. And I found these SF guys from Vietnam. And, uh, you know, so they were teaching me 
tactics and they were teaching me firearms. Mm -hmm. They were teaching me more importantly, how to think logically about things on the battlefield mm -hmm. and in life in general. I mean, I got so much oh, yeah. from these guys, Project Delta guys from Vietnam, which is there's a couple mm -hmm. books out about Project Delta in Vietnam now. There's not, not that many, but they passed along so much to me. Um, but uh, yeah, and absolutely, absolutely incredible. Those guys and saying enough great things yeah. about them. But yeah, I think we. The first time I saw it was on a carry handle, right? I mean, it was like a mm -hmm. aim point on the top of the carry handle. Well, so if you look at it, um, the Sante Raiders, when they did the Sante Raid in '70, uh, they had a red dot style. It wasn't a true. It was a occlusive where your firing eye was was basically occluded by the red dot superimposed in the eye, and then your non firing would see kind of what you're seeing and the magic worked out, which you can some, you can kind of do that today as well with modern day, uh, electronic ones. But, um, it was this big argument back in the day. Oh, that's going to make you slower. It needs batteries. Everyone's making excuses. Well, it's pretty much standard. If you have a carbine, you're oh, putting yeah. a red dot on there. Yeah. Right. Why are we bucking the whole concept of a handgun putting a red dot on there? I mean, it's like, boom. I mean, that's go. kind of the standard, you know? Nice. What are you running there? But uh, So it's a Walther PDP with the aim point acro. Okay. Um, I'll put a shameless plug, shameless plug, Warhog 5, save you 5% with aim point. Hey, there so, you go. Again, nice. Nice. Enclosed, Love enclosed red dot. Yeah, buddy. I haven't used the arco enclosed, though. I need to use the arco. I, I think I have one around here somewhere. I just need to it, mount it. So, but here's, here's the key thing, right? And this is what I try to do. So part of it is educating guys. Yeah. Half of these guys aren't educated on what they're getting. So I, I look at these red dot sites out there and they're all open admitters. So if you kind of understand what the acro, it's a closed admitter. Yep. So dirt debris is not going to have you lose the red dot on this. But then you sit there and, and you see some of these other ones. So I won't say any other brand names to throw them under the bus, but it, you know, if they've got a piece of glass, yeah. the admitter is basically shooting up there to superimpose the red dot on there. Okay. And these, these guys don't even understand that that's a fail point built in. And I'm like, guys, just know what your equipment is. So I need to go um, to the Arco is what you're telling me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Acro. 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 Yeah. Acro. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, shameless plugs, warhog.com. You'll see me doing a video shoot with uh, Pino Productions who does my instructional yeah. uh, videos. But when we did the PDP launch, it, for whatever reason, it was out there just pouring that day. We didn't plan it. Yeah. And I'm running the acro acro on there. And it was just one of those points to go, hey, man, it's raining. I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about water getting on this dot, me losing the red dot. Um, I know it's going to be there. So part of this whole thing, Jack, is just educating these guys going, what are you buying? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a day late, dollar short. Yeah, They they look at price point and go, well, I got to outfit, let's say 100 officers. Yeah. All right. Well, if I can save 100 bucks, all right, well, great. You're saving some money. But are you? What type of quality is it? And then you got to go, I'm giving this officer life-saving equipment that has a fail point built into it. Wouldn't you like to educate them on it? Or worse yet, when we're doing these red dot classes, I'll ask officers, hey, what happens when you put that red dot? And I used to, I used to red. say red shirt. Yeah, I used to say red shirt, but now we got to say a suspect's red shirt. Because when I say red shirt, like, why would we point at the instructor? I said, Okay. Dude, yeah, yeah. It, so it, it, it's right, like right. common sense, right? Not clicking. So now I have to say, what happens when you put your red dot on a suspect's red shirt? Mm. And the looks on their face, Jack, is like, oh, I never thought about it. And I'm like, guys, you're carrying a piece of life saving equipment and you haven't thought about it or worse yet, tested it. Yeah. So that's where um, just trying to educate them on that. Yeah. I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it come around. But man, I just wish these guys would spend a little bit more time, know what they're getting, and then, you know, be proficient with that new tool they have. Right. You know, God forbid they're in that deadly force encounter, either save themselves or save their partners, whatever the case may be. So, um, yeah, man, it's, yeah. that keeps us busy. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you're right. As far as red dots being on most pistols, I mean, you're seeing it, it's already, we're already headed that way. But uh, I need to take a course. That's really why I carry, um, I don't carry the, the red dot just because I haven't put in the time yet um, since I left the military. I mean, I've done 
courses, you know, but I haven't done them the way that I used to. I'll do like one or two a year, but I haven't gone to like, Hey, I'm going to a week. I'm going wherever I'm going, or I'm going three days and I'm putting this thing through the paces and I'm really getting to know it. Um, I just haven't mm-hmm. taken the time to do that yet. So when I get out there to actually to, to train, I take what I'm familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I need to get, I keep threatening to, to go out and, and actually do a course rather than just, you know, okay, this thing works. Okay. I kind of get it here. Red dot. Okay, good. No, I need to put a lot of rounds through before I'm going to carry that well, thing like that every day. So typically I am carrying the, uh, just my, my irons. Yeah. But you do and you don't. So uh, I'll just ask a question, you know, how much dry fire are you doing? Yeah. Not much these days. It, it, that's, that's the key thing. Yeah. You know, you're a lot of writing, maintain a lot of writing, uh, a lot of scripts, a lot of books, but, no, uh, <laughs> it, it, trust me. It, you know, so, I haven't so, slung many arrows lately, which I need to do, uh, and, yeah. uh, and haven't done as much dry fire in, as I have in the past, but luckily I have a good well, solid foundation. Yeah. Well, it, but I, again, dry fire will give you that base, yeah. you know, where, Hey, with the red I can start, start working the dot and start just being proficient with a yeah. good presentation on that. Um, I'm with you with the writing thing because it's funny. Um, I've got a book that's, uh, what, 20 plus years in the making. Okay. We're finally gonna, we're finally gonna execute, but I, I've got a short story I got to do first. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So I got hit up by, um, what was it? Uh, I think it's like your call project, if I remember right. And they're collecting a bunch of anything from OEF, OIF veterans, whether it's stories, poems, whatever. And I'm basically writing a little deal about Duco. Um, I, I'm making it a little bit different, right? So it's a nonfiction, but I pulled kind of a playbook from Eddie Gallagher. Uh, when we had him on, on the range podcast, he was talking about his book and his QR codes. So now I'm trying to get savvy to plug some QR codes yeah. in there. So as you're reading, cool, click the QR code, take you to a video. Yep. Um, Smart move. Just to get a, you know, just to get a little more interaction with the user. So um, that's been an interesting, you know, so it's one thing kind of to sit there and write, but now you're trying to add different layers to there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see how, how that goes. So excited for that one. Yeah. Um, so, so somebody else is, you know, that's going in a collection, which is going to benefit um, We Defy Foundation. Nice. So it's like, yeah, that's cool. And, and again, helps keep Duco story alive. Yeah. Um, my other one was a marksmanship book that I started back when I was at the Safawa Committee. Okay. So the Special Force Advanced Urban Combat Committee. It was just like a marksmanship kind of one-on-one handbook. Um, I still might keep some of my 90s pictures in there just for chuckles. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, after talking to Eddie, I was like, dude, I can put some QR codes in that. And now as you're reading, cool, click the QR code. And I, I haven't quite mastered how to get it to go to certain places. So we got to do some... Yeah. QR code work on that, but, um, try to do a self-publish through like Amazon and get it out there and just see, you know, here's nice. another tool for people that they can take out to the range, at, you know, yeah. stick it in your range bag oh, or whatever. So fantastic idea. Keep me posted on that, on those, when they come out, I want to definitely yeah. support the cause and get them. But, yeah. uh, yeah. So this one, this is a, uh, hardcover. We did three, usually they don't do a hardcover for a movie tie-in. You just do a paperback mm-hmm. and a trade paperback, which is like a bigger, bigger version. But I wanted to do a hardcover and Simon and Schuster let me do it. Uh, and I put a new forward in here that talks about how the mm-hmm. book came to be, how the series came to be. And then they put exclusive photos in here, um, from the, from the set. So it's, so it's different. Um, but yeah. my other idea, what I wanted to do, which we didn't, we didn't end up doing just cause it ran out of time. There's so much going on was to put the QR code in and have, uh, a, uh, an exclusive, um, website, whatever set up where it takes you to a conversation with me and Chris, uh, about it. Yeah. So, uh, but didn't get that far, but at least got the forward in there and got the photos in there. So that's uh, and in hardcover, uh, for, for the terminal list. So that was, that was a, a victory right there, but I did want to have, try to figure out, Hey, QR code, have it go someplace mm-hmm. where now you have me and Chris Pratt talking about something or other. So you get, yep. but, uh, but you know, didn't, didn't get that far, but it was, it was, uh, in my proposal when I, uh, when I sent it to Simon mm-hmm. and Schuster. But it, that totally changes writing. Yeah. So now, I, I mean, imagine that, because you've done something I think that I don't know any other author has done. So you're very much about, Hey, how are we promoting just not the book, but you're going, Hey, we've got little trailers. We've got other things that tie in really getting the reader to the author. I mean, it's just for me to you, Jack, I mean, it, you've taken things from a writer standpoint to, to new levels. I mean, granted, there's been a bunch of people to get, you know, 
um, movies done and stuff like that. But to watch this whole transformation uh, of the terminal list. And here's the thing. I'd say Amazon's a fool if they don't continue keeping this thing going throughout the series. Yeah, so. we'll see. I think they're uh, they're Amazon and Chris's team are talking right now, so we'll see what mm-hmm. uh, what they come up with. You never you never know. You know, I'm just uh, yeah. I'm just thrilled we got this thing made. Now that I know what it's like to uh, to get something made in Hollywood. Now, one mm-hmm. of my takeaways is that I'm shocked that anything gets made in Hollywood, uh, and that anything good gets made because there are so many opportunities for it to go off the rails. Um, yeah. But uh, but thrilled we got it done. But you know, it's it's all it is. Yeah, uh, when you're talking about you know building this readership and and all the rest of it, it's the same thing we talked about earlier about adapting on the battlefield. I'm, mm-hmm. All I did when I stepped into this space was look at it the same way I would look at the battlefield and say, okay, uh, where where do you capitalize on momentum? Where are there gaps? Um, how can I adapt? What is available for me as an author in order to build a readership that wasn't available to an author in 1985 or 95? Mm-hmm. Okay, identify those. Okay, how do I add value to people's lives throughout the year, whether it's a, a social media post or it's a podcast or whatever it, it might be? Because um, yep. you couldn't have done that in 1985, but guess what? Mm-hmm. You can now. But you also get to yeah. choose how you're going to interact with people and if you're going to be a positive influence on them, uh, and if you're going to add value to people's lives or if you're just going to throw up you know memes here or there not put really any thought into it or not think about coordinated campaigns around things but really for mm-hmm. me it's all about adding value to people's lives throughout the year that's uh that's what mm-hmm. really that's what i think about before i do any sort of a post any sort of a blog any sort of a campaign add anything to the the website as far as uh you know uh, gear merch goes you know um, mm-hmm. it has to be super high end uh and it all has to be coordinated um, but any yeah. post, whether one one sentence I put on social media has to add value. Um, so that's mm-hmm. kind of how I how I looked at it. Yeah. No, I mean, you do a great job because it's very historical, right? So you're hitting this historical stuff. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm a culprit of the uh, the Monday funnies. People, <laughs> people, but see, here's the thing. I kept it going. So I, I dabbled with it, you know, and then people were like, man, I love this. I love yeah, to start yeah. my week off with a laugh. And I, I can't stand social because it's such a manipulated platform. Yeah. Um, but it's a necessary evil, you know, when you run a business. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's that's digital marketing in this day and age. But it, it's people want to complain about constitutional violations and everything else. It, our First Amendments are being crushed left and right. And even with the podcast, you know, I find that you don't get full reach. Now you got to start thinking, okay, cool. Is print? Is that our final piece? Is that the final piece that we have that we can truly put pen to paper and get, you know, um, our freedom of, of speech out there? I mean, I, I don't know. It's just a crazy place we're in, but. Yeah, I mean, we're walking um, into it. We're walking into an, amb- an L ambush, essentially. Uh, and we're walking right in and we keep walking right in because these things mm-hmm. are necessary for us to, to build businesses these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're yeah. walking in and you have this, this L of, uh, you know, big tech and, and big government and we're walking, yeah. we're walking right into it. And of course there's a direct connection between those two, oh, uh, you know, just look at lobbying yeah. dollars or whatever else. And they both benefit from what, from us being divided politicians b- mm-hmm. benefit because it galvanizes bases, tech companies, uh, they benefit because they can manipulate not just behaviors, now, but mm-hmm. thoughts now. So there's a direct oh, connection yeah. and here we go walking right into that L ambush. So it's a, uh, it's a tough one to, to deal with, but if you recognize it, okay, that's, that's step number one is to recognize it. Mm-hmm. And then you can, you know, take steps uh, from there to once again, adapt. But uh, those two entities are getting more powerful and we're just we continue to walk right in, but it's a what, tough time, man. It's tough. We, we got to try to educate people. I mean, that that's the biggest thing. So it's like, you know, here at my desk, I mean, I've got a copy of the constitution. Nice. And I, I refer to this thing all the time, Great. right? Because people want to sit there. It, number one, they, they haven't even read it. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and again, without getting into a whole political road here, uh, people are making claims that they have constitutional rights that have been violated. Read it. I, I just, I call it the book, right? So I, I got it. Our founding fathers didn't write it in a book format, but I'm calling it the book mm-hmm. because it sits right here on my desk. Read it. See what it tells you. It's pretty clear cut. Yeah. And I wish, I, I wish more, and, it, and it's easy reading, and I wish more people would just read it to understand, you know, when you want to sit there and hoop and holler and make these statements, especially politicians, you're not even stating fact. And, and it's not your opinion to say something's unconstitutional. Uh, it, that's a clear cut. Either it is or it isn't. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing is, 
let's get people to understand what the constitution actually says. Let's get people to understand what your rights actually are Mm -hmm. before you start hooping and hollering what's in violation. Because let's think about it. I'm entitled to freedom of speech. But if we can't speak freely as Americans, or you want to oppress it, or certain people have powers to put that down, is that not a violation of my First Amendment rights? And people go, well, you know, it's my platform. Okay, you can say that. So then you sit there and go, all right, well, is writing, because if, if you publish your own book, is that the only true form of free speech? Or what I started to say on, on the podcast was coming to you live from the corner of 5th and Main. Mm. So it's a classic town. Or do we have to go back to the town squire? Mm. I, I mean, I don't know. Because yeah. you just want to educate people on, on hey, we're, yeah. we're going down some crazy roads. Yeah. And, you know, let's understand really what freedoms we have and, and how we get there. But oh, yeah. um, no, I get my mature, kids. I, I gave my kids four things when I retired, uh, my retirement ceremony. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I gave them uh, a Bible and a, an old antique nautical compass and gave them mm-hmm. those and said, these are, uh, here's, these are there's to guide you. And then I gave them a leather bound copy of the, of the constitution and said, here are natural rights are, uh, mm-hmm. are enshrined in here. And uh, then I handed him a tomahawk and said, here's the, here's the means to defend it. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but uh, educating kids. Uh, there it is. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you right there. What, what do you have there? Yeah. So it's a Winkler. Nice. So this is, this is the one, uh, Let's see. Help, nice. Look at that. There. Okay. Yeah, buddy. Oh. So this is the one I had, um, I carried overseas. So this is the one I did the unboxing with. So nice. I figured it was only right. Thank you. Um, yeah, buddy. So it's, you know, I'm not going to say anything bad, but you know, James Reese's tomahawks, they were all kind of nice and pristine. Yeah. I mean, get a look there at, right we got there. a little bit of, yeah. yeah, buddy. You know, so, uh, like I can tell you like that, that rub mark there, that was all from getting on and off little birds, you know, just from the way it would rub there on the handle. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, bomb makers. So we had to do a gig with, uh, partner four. So, uh, that ding right there Yeah. had to use one of their Humvees getting in to get old Abu nice. anus uh, was the guy <laughs> we were going after. So he was an interesting cat. He was a, uh, um, he was missing a hand. So it's like, Hey man, mm-hmm. your target has a prosthetic hand. Okay. And of course, the Iraqis are like, he's not here. I'm like, really? So you're trying to facilitate them doing it. So you walk up there and you see this one guy sitting there with his hand kind of, does that look right? Squeeze his little fingers, their rubber. It's like, yeah. So wow. that was just kind of one of those that, you know, I remember that one where all these other dings and scratches all came from, but yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Just, you know, Winkler makes some, uh, some great stuff and amazing. Yeah. I was there so last was week of, with uh, Kevin Holland, um, yeah. who is both at uh, Development Group and and CAG, mm-hmm. and, I, I, and, I, and and so he's a what, what a so, great guy. Oh my yeah, gosh. I know Kevin very well, and if you ask him about the hatchet, he'll probably give you some more. I will. Oh, details. We, yeah, we've talked or, a lot or, about or, the hatchet. I see zero zero one. We were uh, looking at that and uh, all the dings in there, and uh, yeah, I mean, amazing. Everyone tells well, a story. Every one of those I tells a story. Can, I doubt you'll see. Uh, hard to see. I see something there. It's 28. No way. Yeah. Man. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So, uh, so I'll let you put, you can put the piece of the pie together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, gotcha. Yeah. Amazing. But no, this is just, you know, it's one of those, it, it's a family heirloom now, right? Yeah. So it's one of those that, Hey, you carried on the battlefield and it's like, yeah. So, uh, we put it up here and kind of let people see, but I just, I thought it was very fitting. Thank you. Um, you know, for the, the unboxing of in the blood, it's like, Hey man, it lets you use, you know, a Winkler Tomahawk. Um, yeah. So that one's got some miles on it right there. And I love, I love those dings and I love those scratches. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We did, I did a podcast with Kevin, um, out there and with Winkler too. So we talk about some of that stuff when, uh, I got to forge a, uh, forge a tomahawk and, uh, and Kevin forged uh, another blade out there and we got mm-hmm. some, some content around it, but spent some time drinking whiskey and, and having a, having some good talks, but, uh, oh, yeah. we have an amazing, amazing guy. Yeah. Ke- Kevin's great people. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing with Daniel. I mean, just two great Americans. Um, yeah, I, I'll be interested to see the podcast, I guess I'll have to reach out to Kevin, see if he wants to be, uh, on the range and just BS. So there you go. He's, uh, he's done some very unique things. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And continues yeah. to do them. I mean, my oh, yeah. goodness. Oh, it's still, it's still getting still, after it. Yeah. 
still getting after it. He's texting and me from Afghanistan and t- last year in 2020, you know, after the, after the fall and then mm-hmm. uh, after the withdrawal and then texting me from Ukraine and we're doing some stuff, uh, mm-hmm. you know, asking anyway, it was, yeah, he's, he's yeah. Incredible no, guy. Kevin, that's just the way he is, you know, and he continues to serve. He's done some, some other uh, entrepreneurial ventures along the road, which is pretty cool, but it, it's just, you know, one of those quiet professionals, people, people will never know his name. Right. And he can just run it that way, which is fantastic. Um, for those of us that are trying to run businesses, unfortunately, you got to be out there in the the public limelight, go, Hey, this is what we do. This is kind of what we're doing. Um, but no, I think, cause I, I think I saw something, did you guys go on a hunting trip or something last year? Uh, I was supposed to, and then I had to work, finish the book. So I didn't get to go. Okay. We were going together I, though. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I saw a picture somewhere in there. Yeah. We were up at, uh, we did the SIG Hunter games. So he, we, okay. we did that and he was the, uh, the RSO for, for my team. And, uh, we were with Bullet Valentina, a uh, UFC fighter. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we had a great time. We got second place. Um, but so not bad, not bad for being off the gun, off the gun for, for a while, but, uh, mm-hmm. but it was awesome. We had a great time together. Um, yeah, it was, I'm, I'm glad we got, I yeah, was, got second. That was good. Yeah, especially we had some some we had made some military snipers out there. We had some really good good, mm-hmm. good crew, good good crew. Um, but that was fun. We had a great time. So that was that's probably yeah. the picture you're you're uh, you're thinking of. But then yeah, we're supposed to go hunt this last year. And we're supposed to go hunt this year. But once again, there's so much going on. I think I'm gonna have to like clear the deck for the fall, unfortunately, and uh, no, or fortunately, I guess. Um, yeah, because there's all these things that I need to I need to prioritize probably this fall and uh, <laughs> and do instead. But I, you know, that's that's the time that we're in right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the thing is the entrepreneur, right? It's, it's that balance. So you're sitting there trying to, you know, run your business, but then people forget you, you got to balance your family life. Yeah. Then, then you got to balance your friendships and everything else. It, you know, here's the thing, Jack, um, take me a long time to get there. It, it, it finally, um, I did a marriage retreat with all secure foundation. Um, what was it last month, June? Game changer. Oh, wow. Life changer. No kidding. Yeah. Life changer. Yeah. 100%. Um, because you, you got to think we'd, we'd lived a life that we had a mistress involved. And unfortunately it was called either Navy SEALs, U.S. Army, whatever you want. Uh, at least that's the way I looked at it because it took more time away from us and from our families. Yeah. You know, I, I blatantly lied to my wife uh, on a deployment one time. I mean, she needed me to come home and I'm sitting there going, they won't let me come home and they're going, Hey, you can go home. Oh, she doesn't need me. You know, so, so you're lying on both ends because you want to stay in the game. I, I don't want to leave theater. I don't want to leave my boys back here. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, so when you, you think about it, you kind of live this constant lie going, you do anything dangerous. Of course not. You know, you're not doing this. You're not going to harm's way. She knows better, but you're always telling something just to try to appease them and keep them from worrying. Um, and, and it, it comes with consequences. Yeah. You know, you don't do 13 deployments and have all that other stuff without having some baggage that comes attached. And I'm going to tell you, man, that, that marriage retreat with, uh, Tom Satterley and, and all secure foundation mm. game changer. Awesome. Well, what's going forward for you? We got November coming up. We got the, uh, the, the event, um, that you have coming, coming up here in November. Uh, you're yep. doing these courses, military LE, uh, people can go on website, find more, find, find out the leashes. Yep. What else do you have on there? What else do you, what do you give your videos? I know uh, they're linked to a bunch of different things. Yep. I mean, very, they're very educational, um, great info out there. So highly encourage everybody to follow you, check out the website, um, do all those things. So, I mean, yeah, you get a lot on your plate. Yeah. It, but here's the thing, Jack, I, I think that's the way that's, what we thrive on, yeah. right? It's, it's, if we were just sitting around doing nothing, We'd be bored and probably getting ourselves in trouble, but I probably take on too much. Like I didn't have to do the canine documentary, mm. but it was one of those that, Hey, it's too important not to, um, I am going to do probably towards, uh, late summer, fall. I am going to open up some open enrollment classes to my civilian students, um, somewhere around the North Carolina here area. Okay. Just, just because travel, I mean, it's to travel all over the country, but again, prices are just out of control. Um, whether it's airline tickets, you know, um, gas prices, just traveling in your car. So if I kind of keep it here local, uh, we'll open some stuff up. So, you know, I, I always encourage people 
warhog.com. That's my website, yeah. W-A-R-H-O-2-G's dot uh, com. Because some people don't realize my last name's Hog. Yeah. Um, but fantastic. if you sign up for the new, yeah, if you sign up for the <laughs> newsletter, it, because again, that's, I quasi control that. You know, yep. granted, sometimes these spam filters and other things can stop people from getting emails because I've done business emails where it's like, hey, dude, I sent you an email two weeks ago. Have you got it? It's like, nope. Hang on. Let me check the spam folder or junk folder. Sure enough, there's your email sitting at. So um, it, it's just, it, it's all that. It kind of goes back to all that um, First Amendment violations, I like to say. But here and there, um, that's pretty much the one stop shop. Yeah, that's the, the you know that's what I control. That's where I drive people to. But people, I think we're on the same wavelength. Because you put out a lot of stuff about history. I tell all these guys that I talk to from the young entrepreneurship, it's like put your name in the brand. So if you think about it, why is you know uh, Smith and Wesson Smith and Wesson? Why is Colt Colt? The end of defense. The end of defense. Glock Glock. I mean, they are people's names. It just so happens having the name Hog, yes, as you're growing up as a kid, it's a interesting battle to have. But hey, once you get out as an adult, um, seemed like the War Hog just kind of fit. Yeah, no, it's uh, great. It's great. You don't forget it, that's so, for sure. No. So we, we ran with it. But it, it's it's instilling history. I think that's the whole part. So uh, even my brand, I can talk history with people and hopefully try to help them mm. go, all right, you know, here's something to think about. And we've had some interesting names. I'm not going to lie. There's been some people with some interesting names. Like, we'll just work some vocabulary and um, might even pull out a dictionary, which I hate the ones on the phone. Just get the old school, you know. Old school is the way to go. You can still find one. Yep. You got to uh, get them now. I don't even know if they, yeah. Before they're gone forever. Yeah. Or go or back def- and buy or some. definitions buy some, are changed. Some the, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's really interesting yeah. to go back and look at definitions from uh, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, mm-hmm. and see, see changes. Um, oh yeah. So yeah, I highly encourage everybody to get a couple different dictionaries from different eras. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you were doing that with, um, with, uh, encyclopedias That's right. as well. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah. So I need to work on, work on that. I want to get, uh, from twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, um, and get those lined up. And then you can really go and look at same entry for a certain event, but see how it yeah. has shifted over time. Um, and now you can't even, I don't even know. I don't think you even buy a, a set of encyclopedias anymore. Um, I don't, physical. I think, yeah, no, everything's digital, but yeah. history doesn't change. That's the key part. You know, people need to understand history. History is history. It is written in stone. It's not something that I opt to go. Oh, well that really didn't happen. It, it did or it didn't, you know, people seem to forget. Um, you look at 1860, over 660,000 Americans, we killed each other mm. over, over some principles of the Constitution. That's what it boiled down to. I mean, that's how powerful people's um, beliefs in the Constitution were, were sitting at. And, and I just ask people to go, hey, look at your history books. 660,000, you know, Americans by our own hands, more than any other conflict we've been in. Mm-hmm. It's just, if you, if you understand that history, you understand where we're coming from. Oh yeah. To me, that's huge. And that's why I so yeah. try to encourage people to read every chance they get. Cause there's so many more distractions these days and that it's so easy to be outraged and we're encouraged to be outraged and retweet things from people who also didn't put the requisite time, energy, and effort into studying mm-hmm. the, uh, uh, the issue at hand. And you know, that's a disservice to those who died to give us these options and opportunities yeah. and freedom we have today. And it's a disservice to future generations. Cause really what we're doing today isn't about us. It's about these future generations, uh, and what we're passing, what freedoms uh, and options One. and opportunities we're passing along to them. So it's really not about yeah. us today. When we go into that voting booth, um, it's about future generations. And you know, this, I don't know if this is the only time in us history where we've done it, but it's certainly at the forefront where we're actively trying to take away rights from one another, not adding it, uh, rights, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, oh, it's a tough one. It, tough it is to tough, but it, but here's the thing. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt hit it back in the, uh, early 1900s. He said, as soon as you part, as soon as you start putting something in front of the title American, you already caused division. Mm-hmm. You know, if we were all Americans, the, the, the constitution, I, I love to grab this thing and show it when I'm podcasting or talking, because this is tangible that you can put in your hands, read it, understand it. And then people, if you're more educated on it, on the very freedoms, like some people don't even know the freedoms they have. And that's the sad part. Yeah. 
is if you don't even know what's being taken from you, how can you even make an argument for it? Yep. It's a, a dumbing so, down of the electorate. Uh, is it by design? It, hmm. um, and interesting, I talked to some people from the, went through boot camp in the 60s and, uh, you know, I, I don't know positive confirmation like of like photos of this or anything or videos of it or anything but uh, i believe that they were taught in boot camp they studied the constitution and they studied the mm -hmm. bill of rights um, because you're swearing mm -hmm. to uphold and defend something um so they studied it when i went through we did not uh even mm -hmm. in an ocs we did not uh very curious yeah. what they're doing at our uh military academies very curious what they're what they're doing as far as studying the constitution at those uh at those institutions so it's things are 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 different. Is that by design? Why do you think they took that out and put other things in? Well, I'll let uh, I'll let the listener decide. Yeah, no, it's it, you're you're spot on. And I mean, if if you're not educated to make a decision, so you sit there and uphold to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know what the Constitution says, right? What are you defending? So why did they take it out of the curriculum and boot camps? <laughs> mm -hmm. it, That's you a would good think, question. It, you would think, right? Hey, if you're willing to lay your life down for this piece of paper, for lack of better terms, right here, wouldn't you like to know what's written in there? I, I, I challenge if you're a U.S. service member listening, you know, go get your, you know, copy of the Constitution, read it, see what it says. It's not a long read. It's super short. I mean, super thin. You know, you can you can put it in your cargo pocket and have it every single day. Put it in your Ziploc bag. Boom, there you go. But yeah, if if people would just understand that, where would we be at today? Yeah, not one hour devoted to uh, <laughs> to to study or understanding that document that you're swearing mm -hmm. to. Oh man, it's out of all that time that you have in boot camp. You know, all the time you're polishing things or you know polishing your boots yeah. or whatever else. Maybe slip in a half hour there. And uh, maybe talk about this thing uh, called the United States Constitution mm -hmm. and the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Now you have to take it on yourself. Now you have to do it. You have to take that, uh, that ownership. You have to take that personal initiative. And uh, you have to do it yourself because no one's really going to mm -hmm. do it for you. Unless you have a mentor uh, growing up or in the military that's going to guide you uh, in the right direction. But you don't even need that because uh, you can come to that realization yourself. Um, but it certainly yeah. helps to have somebody out there that's going to guide you. That's no doubt about that. Well, well, mentors, I mean, you've mentioned it before, Jack, mentors are important. Mm -hmm. You know, who you're getting that information from, who's giving you it. And again, it doesn't have to be this long drawn out. It can be one little snippet, right? One snippet that you can stick in your pocket. And I think with, uh, you were saying your Vietnam guys, you know, common sense, mm -hmm. but it, huge, right? People don't think about it. Common um, sense. Yeah. Carl von Clausewitz said it was the most important attribute of a battlefield leader. So did uh, George Marshall. Um, but yeah, apply a little common sense. But, That's why when people saw the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, you didn't need to have read anything about tactics or strategy or foreign affairs no. or military. You'd have never, didn't need to have ever watched a documentary on it. You could just look at it and apply some common sense and ask a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. and that's why there was so much outrage and, you know, it's a tragedy that we don't even talk about it anymore. It's just like, it's like those 20 years, uh, you know, unless you're, you're Gone. a veteran or you're, uh, you're directly yep. impacted by, by it, by having someone come home, uh, or not come home, um, from mm -hmm. those, uh, from those deployments, it's like, it's just disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, because what we owe those next generation of war fighters is to take those lessons and apply them going forward as wisdom. And we have 20 years of it. Of course, the Soviets had 10 years of it. We could have looked at, we could have gone back to the British incursions. We could go back to Alexander the Great or Genghis mm -hmm. Khan. Um, but we have our own 20 year history in Afghanistan. And, uh, if we don't take those lessons and apply them going forward as wisdom, um, then we have failed everybody that went over there and laid it on the line and all those who didn't come back and those who came back, uh, permanently disfigured or, uh, or different dealing with the post uh, with uh, the stress of the battlefield yeah man crazy let's end on a high note hope do you have hope i try to like of course like yeah course, what's, what's your hope for the future it, jack uh, my hope for the future is this right so I, I like to do personal challenges to people so here's here's kind of my hope piece what are you grateful for right mm -hmm. so this day and age people are very uh, the world stinks no it's not because here's the thing if you wake up every single morning and go what am I grateful for? I'm grateful to be alive. Yes. Start yes, your day off. Start your day off there. Right. Gratitude. Yeah. I, I, I like to do three things. So what am I grateful for? And it's not always the same three things. Right. So of course I got my little ritual. Hey, when I wake up, take that first deep breath, mm. you know, I basically thank God for giving me the day, give me the wisdom, power, and strength to get done what he wants done for today. Boom. That's starting my day. Wow. Right. 
because I am. I like here's it. the thing. I'm on this planet because of him. Okay. And I will tell you without a doubt, um, divine intervention. Yeah. On three separate occasions for me that I should not be here. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you walk away unscathed. That's the other part. Right. Mm. It's kind of like in, um, oh, what was that one? Um, I can't think of that movie. Oh, TBI. Pulp, Pulp Fiction when they Pulp finish Fiction. Shoot? Pulp yeah. Fiction. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> what happened? Yeah. I, I've had some of those. Right. So, um, but yeah, that, that's the high note. If people would just wake up, number one, be grateful you're alive yeah. and then capitalize on the day. What are you going to do? Nice. If you do that, you know, be good to people. You know, I, I challenge people to go, hey man, look for your good deed to do. So go. am I saying this to brag? Nope. Uh, it was funny. I was talking to a buddy of mine on the phone yesterday. I had to go to the post office because we had some leashes to drop off, had to do my fulfillment. And here comes this woman on crutches. Could I have just bolted because I need to quickly get out? I could have. Nope. We're going to hold tight. Let her come up here. Here's the door. There you go. Let me grab this other one because it's the double double door at the post office. There you go. Did I need anything out of it? Nope. She's on crutches. I'm just looking to be a good person and help. If we would start doing that, boom, mm -hmm. that's a high note. I got personal joy out of that. When I sit there in podcast and I got people telling me, hey, man, that helped me out or that helped me out or Duco running around with three legs. That motivated me. It, that's fulfillment, right? Look for that in your life. Um, and, and the high note is if you've got something negative in your life, cut it away. You know, if you're sitting there, one of these guys that go, man, social media is bringing me down. Get off social. Yeah. I, I can't stand what's in the news. I don't watch the news. Yeah. Very rarely, right? I might mm -hmm. tune into Fox once in a while, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't need to listen to it. I don't need to be indoctrinated. Yeah. I'm aware of what's going on. Um, but, it, and here's the other thing, get some self-confidence, right? Um, if I were to ask people, you know, who's the best person in the room? Most people are going to go, uh, they're going to look around the room. <laughs> I'll tell you right up. It's this guy. Nice. I care who's less is in there. It's me. And it's not in an arrogant sense. It's in a self-confidence sense. And then I like to add a little more to it. I'm the best person in the room. There's nothing I can't do. I'm an honest broker. I may not be the best, but there's nothing I can't do. If people would walk around with that mentality, you're going to crush life. Yeah. You know, you, you just got to get after it and quit looking for your handout. Yeah. That's, that, that's your high notes. Do some good hard work. Get your hands dirty. Life is good. We can look around and say, yeah, we've got issues going on. You're living, breathing today. What are you doing to capitalize on it? You know, mm -hmm. uh, I would say if you, if you carry a firearm, dry fire, uh, get your workout in. What are you grateful for? Be a good person. And then do something for the next generation. I got grandkids. I, I don't want them. I want them better. So it's kind of like when you go somewhere, uh, you want it better than when you found it. I want my grandkids to have a better, be in a better position than I was, um, you know, growing up. So yeah. Man, you fired me up. I'm going to go tackle this day. I'm going to do some dry firing. I'm going to go do some pull-ups. Man, fire me up, man. I love it. That is, yeah, buddy. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, I used to... Uh, to tell the guys, I'd say, uh, um, uh, well, my goal was always to, was to have them do the job better for the the next group of guys coming in than, mm -hmm. than I did it for them. That was always my, mm -hmm. my goal. Um, but I'd say, you know, don't, don't assume you're the smartest guy in the room because that a little humility right there, but don't assume that you're not as well, mm -hmm. meaning speak up. So I think yeah. those two, those two things, um, <laughs> kind of go, go well together, like maintain that humility, but don't stay silent. You know, if you're, no. especially even a new guy, doesn't matter. Go in there, you're looking at something, you're bringing fresh eyes to it, bringing that common sense to it. Yes. Um, you might be the smartest guy in the room. Um, or don't assume or you, you might are, see something, you know. Right. But, but you might see something they all missed. Oh, yes. Because maybe they Absolutely. got, maybe they got the blinders on. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. man. Dude. I'm so <laughs> glad we did this. You fired me up. And I love that last little piece right there. So I hope people really, uh, We'll write those down. We'll think about them. We'll incorporate those yeah. uh, those things that you mentioned into into their lives. Because I think you wake up like that and start the day like that with gratitude. Uh, try to 100%. make somebody's day. Um, I got this yeah. uh, text yesterday from the. Uh, well, I talked to two World War II veterans yesterday on the phone, um, and but one of them texted me, and he's like, "I know you're busy, uh, so don't 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 call. I just want, don't need a text back. Um, I just but just want to let you know, just got out of the ER. I've uh, been in there all day. They drained my lungs of a quart and a half of fluid and 
Um, but, uh, you know, I know you're busy, so don't, you know, no need to respond type of a thing. Of course I call immediately, yeah. you know, and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and get to talk to him for a little bit, but, uh, but he appreciate, I mean, he's creeping up on a hundred years old and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and he so appreciated that. So of course I'm taking the time to, to do that. It's an honor for me to be able to do that, but, but, you know, try to tell the kids don't, you know, never miss an opportunity to make somebody's day, especially like that, di- like that when it's handed to you, you know, or and, you and seeing the person on the crutches or whatever it might be. Yep. Um, never miss an opportunity to do that. That's it. That's huge, man. Never miss an opportunity. I, I mean, take that to the bank because there's so many opportunities missed, but that's it, man. And, and I love the guys that, that are, that had that humility. Hey man, I know you're busy. Yeah. Cool. You're reaching out. I'm going to get you something back. Might be a text, might be a call. There's going to be a personal connection, yeah. but the, the humility, humility side is like, Hey man, I get it. But yeah, Jack, that's, those guys are something else, man. Oh yeah. We owe, we owe them more than we'll ever be able to. Oh, repay. but they don't expect 20. anything either. That generation. That's nope. the other part of it. They, they, they expect don't. nothing. And, uh, they got back from world war two and got to work and they didn't expect <laughs> that handout. I mean, we had the GI bill. No. Okay. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Great program. Um, they sure. didn't expect it. You know, no. <laughs> they went in there to, to do the job and I love talking to these mm-hmm. guys and I love my daughter gets to talk to these, these guys, you know, a generation removed, two yeah. generations removed. Um, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's, uh, you know, my grandfather, I never met him. He died in world war two. Um, mm-hmm. um, but she's heard about it, but she's even more farther removed than I am from that generation. But now she's sitting across the table with somebody and she's talking to them and she's hearing the stories about somebody who was first in his stick, Tom Rice, to jump out in Normandy, uh, 101st Airborne, first guy yeah. to jump uh, out of his out of his plane. Uh, another guy mm-hmm. crash landed, 82nd Airborne, crash landed a, in a glider, uh, you know, yeah. in, into a field in uh, in Normandy. Uh, another guy out of the landing craft, one of the first guys to hit that beach, uh, run mm-hmm. through machine gun fire, egg Germans in elevated positions, no cover of concealment. Oh, yeah. And then they all went on through like Battle of the Bulge and all the way to Berlin. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just incredible. That gen- and then they got home and got to work and they didn't complain. They did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just, oh, absolutely incredible. amazing. And they're all creeping up on a hundred or over it. And so anyone out there that has an opportunity to spend some time with World War II veteran, don't put it off. Go spend some time no, with them. That, that, that's why we want to capture that history. Yeah. I mean, we find one of those canine handlers. Trust me, we'll be there almost next day. Yeah, but let's get that history. Awesome. I'm going to so, go email uh, or text Donnie right now. Donnie Edwards, awesome. the best defense foundation. And, uh, and, and so we can do, cause they've, they've talked right, to a Jack. lot of world war two veterans over the years. And, uh, I have to think that dogs have been brought up, um, as part of those uh, conversations that they've had. So I'm going to do that right now and I'll text awesome. you back and, uh, All right, buddy. and thanks for doing this brother. Absolutely, bro. And thanks now, for I want to get you back on. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, do it. I want to get you back on on the range. Let's I want to talk some Magnum PI. Yeah, let's do it. Let's. I keep threatening my kids <laughs> that I'm gonna we're gonna sit down Thursday nights and we're gonna watch it for an hour uh, mm-hmm. and and watch the whole the whole thing uh, all the way through. So I haven't done it yet. Um, actually, I talked about it the other day. Uh, I was like, man, we're going to start like Mondays. We're going to watch the A-team, you know, and I can watch MacGyver for an hour. And then we're going to, you know, we're going to do all that. And then uh, Magnum's on Thursday. Uh, So I keep threatening to do that, but uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk some Magnum. That'll be good. And uh, and hopefully I can get on the range with you one of these days. I definitely need a tune up. No doubt about it. And, uh, yeah. and I'm going to do some dry yeah, fire on that, uh, that red dot, but I'm also going to find that new aim point and get it on something here, um, before too long. Yeah, buddy. A special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. I have been a member since 1996. There is my cue card right there. Man, Navy Federal has been with me every step of the way uh, while I was in the military for those 20 years. And now that I am out and they've taken care of me, taken care of my family um, and have had nothing but the best experience with them. So to have them sponsor this podcast is, uh, well, it's humbling and I am, I am honored. Uh, becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union lets you experience more from everyday commutes to your next big vacation. The flagship credit card earns you three times the points on travel so you can get rewarded for wherever you're headed next. Plus this premium travel card has a low annual fee of $49 and two times the points on all purchases outside of travel, meaning the rewards don't have to end even when the vacation does. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online or by phone. And it's so fast. You can get a decision in seconds. Navy Federal has great rates on auto loans. Plus with their car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare and get upfront pricing on your next new or used car. 
at Navy Federal. Members are the mission. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA. It is open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. Flagship rates are variable and range between 10.74% and 18% APR based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one in the Amazon series adaptation of the Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. Today's gear segment is sponsored by Zero Foxtrot. Zero Foxtrot provides unique products that reflect the old school vintage military lifestyle. I've actually been following these guys for a while. Love what they're doing. Have a bunch of other shirts and coffee mugs downstairs from uh, uh, from the last few years. Just love it when guys get out and absolutely crush it. Zero Foxtrot is veteran founded and is a proud supporter of our nation's defenders, veterans, and first responders. I'm actually wearing this shirt. Look at that. Canoe Club USA. What does that mean? I think you're going to have to look it up in your web browser, the Google machine. Canoe Club USA, awesome shirts out there. They have limited edition ones that drop every now and again that are super cool. So definitely go to zerofoxtrot.com. And right now, we have an exclusive code for listeners of Danger Close. Use code JC at checkout for 20% off your order. Very cool. Remember, you can gear up with Zero Foxtrot and use code JC at checkout for 20% off your order. Just go to zerofoxtrot.com slash JC and remember to use code JC for 20% off at checkout or just click the link in the description. Once again, that offer code is JC. Gear up with Zero Foxtrot and use code JC for 20% off. Awesome. Definitely do that and check out all they have going on. Follow them on the social channels. They have some great things out there. They do some history posts every now and again that are really cool and very well thought out. Definitely check out zerofoxtrot.com for all the stuff. They have Zippo lighters in there. They have these mugs right here. What does that say? Drink coffee, stack bodies, stay zero. Love this. And then this one right here, this is cool. This might be a limited edition one. I'm not sure. Um, but for St. Patrick's Day, lack fear not beer. Look at that. Boom. Love it. Awesome. So that's what they look like right there. Zero Foxtrot. Let me get a little of that action right there. That's a sticker. But uh, check out their t-shirts, mugs right here. Whiskey glasses. These are some of my favorites right there. Look at that. Oh yeah. Solid. So check them out for sure. Zerofoxtrot.com slash JC for 20% off. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right, a couple things today. Uh, on book tour, people brought me so many amazing things. I mean, bottles of whiskey, uh, blades, uh, tomahawks, books, amazing. And uh, somebody brought me this old Naval Special Warfare. Uh, this is Navy Special Warfare uh, recruiting pamphlet from the 70s. And uh, pretty cool. Uh, so thank you so much. I want to be careful with it because it's been around a while. But uh, there it is, UDT seal right there. These old pictures are incredible. Um, Vietnam right there, shotgun. I mean, this is pretty sweet. Um, and yeah, look at that. So pretty cool. And right here it says, uh, reviewed and approved on 1 November 1971, right there. Um, and this is from the Navy Recruiting Branch Station in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. But uh, very cool. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, man, too cool. And he also gave me this right here. Little bumper sticker. Solid. Uh-huh. Yeah, frogman, join our Navy. Awesome. Thank you 
so much. And everybody else who, who brought things, coins, so many uh, law enforcement, uh, military, first responders, firefighters, um, brought coins and patches and uh, I have all that stuff. It means so much to me in the new podcast studio. I'm going to figure out a good place to, to put all those. So, so thank you so much. Um, what else? Sitka. Nice. Uh, John Barclow at Sitka sent this over. Uh, check him out at Knowledge from Storms. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge uh, about going into the, the back country. This is the ambient hoodie right here. So that looks like a great piece of kit and looking forward to trying that out this fall. So uh, John Barclow, thank you so much. John was on the podcast last uh, last year. So you can check out the conversation that, uh, that we had together. Um, Awesome. Sick of gear. Amazing. And you might recognize this pattern from Chris Pratt in the terminal list at the beginning of episode four. So you can check that out as well. And he wears a Sitka t-shirt in there in episode two. Hmm, how did that happen? Pretty cool. All right. Qualo rings. I hope I'm saying that pronoun I'm pronouncing that correctly because I've been wearing one since, uh, when did I get this? 2017? I think I got this. Maybe before that. But anyway, same one right here. Love it. And uh, they sent out a new package of stuff right here to include rings, but they have another line here. So they got uh, a headband here, no tie laces, some apparel, shorts, and a shirt uh, and a quick dry towel. So they're branching out from the rings, which are, are right here. They sent a few different colors, but uh, I love this thing. You don't even know it's, it's there and work out shoot, do all the things that, uh, that you do, work outside, hunt, and uh, don't have to worry about having a actual uh, your actual wedding band on. These things are awesome. Absolutely love it. And then, oh man, John Dudley, thank you. Sent out some arrows. Uh, unfortunately, I can't make it to Total Archery Challenge this year, but I'm setting up my, old, my own course here at the house. So uh, John Dudley at Knock On sent me out a set of new arrows. So Thank you, my friend. Uh, you might recognize this from the opening credits to the terminal list where we have a, uh, a bow there. And then also in uh, a couple episodes, you can see uh, the knock-on mat right there uh, in James Reese's garage on his workbench. So uh, John Dudley, knock-on, check out his website, all things archery, um, explore uh, not just gear, but uh, it's so much knowledge on there that John passes along about archery and about bow hunting. So definitely go uh, knock on and check out everything that he has going on. You can follow him on the social channels as well. But uh, John, thank you so much for sending these arrows. I'm going to get the course set up here in the backyard and uh, time to start slinging some arrows. So thank you, my friend. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about what Rick Hogg has going on, go to his website at Warhog Tactical, and that is warhog.com, W-A-R-H-O-G-G.com. You can link to him on the social channels from there, and you can sign up for his newsletter as well. Rick, thanks so much for coming on today. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA, and you can go to the website, officialjackcar.com. You can hit the shop button in the corner for the merch. And until the next time, take care out there. Be safe, stay strong, keep fighting. Mm -hmm.